The fifth International Conference of Pharmaceutical Nanotechnology and Nanomedicine 2021 is sponsored by PT Kino Indonesia and Pengurus Pusat Keluarga Alumni Universitas Pancasila. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before we start this conference, we are going to listen to the report, which will be delivered by the committee chairman of the fifth International Pharmaceutical Nanotechnology and Nanomedicine 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Ando Sapoteker Kosasi, Master of Science. The time is yours. Honorable Rector of Universitas Pancasila, Professor Dr. Edith Hendratno, Honorable Dean of the Faculty of Pharmacy, Universitas Pancasila, Professor Dr. Shirley Kumala, Honorable Speakers, Dr. Chun Waimai of Shanghai Jiatong University, China, Dr. Changi Stiabudi of National Central University, Taiwan, Professor Dr. Henny Ramawati of Institute Technology, Bandung, Indonesia, Professor Dr. Efionora Anwar of Universitas Pancasila, Indonesia, and Dr. Chun Fugo of University Science, Malaysia. Dear oral and poster presenters, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, LOAS, in this opportunity to welcome all of the conference participants by first praying our gratitude and praise to the Almighty God for all His blessing, grace, and mercies that have made us possible together here in this room in excellent condition and health. Today, it gives us immense pleasure in welcoming all of you to this fifth international conference on pharmaceutical nanotechnology, nanomedicine with the dim application of nanotechnology in drugs, cosmetic, and herbal medicines. Our, fac our faculty was established with a vision to serve society in solving problems and challenges at the national and global levels toward excellence in Southeast Asia. One of our mission is organizing quality activities in the pharmaceutical sector and relevant to national and global challenges, such as this conference. This conference was started in 2013, and we will continue it as a part of our, co our, our commitment to the vision. <clears throat> in this exciting moment, please allow us to thank Professor Dr. Eddie Tuthendratno and Professor Dr. Shirley Kumar Kumala, who have provided the committee with valuable experience to, organi to organize this international event. Ladies and gentlemen, this year we are lucky to have with us five honorable speakers whom we have no hesitation in describing as exceptional. And it is an honor for us to welcome. They are from for countries in Asia, such as China, Taiwan, Ma and Malaysia, including Indonesia. During the conference, there will be 26 oral presenters, 24 poster presenters, and more than 100 general particip participants. We also prepare some local and international journals for publishing the presented articles. Of course, it is not complete without allowing us to thank all the committee members who have contributed their efforts so that this conference can be held. Also other people that cannot be explained one by one. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we have prepared this conference with our best efforts, but the perfectness still belongs to God. So if you face any inconvenience during this event, please let us apologize. Finally, we hope you have an engaging and enriching session ahead. Have a nice day and thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to Dr. Randa Sapotaker Kosasi, Master of Science, for the report. Now, Excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to listen to the welcoming speech which will be delivered by the Dean of Faculty of Pharmacy, Universitas Pancasila. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Dr. Apotheker Shili Kumala, Magister Biomed. The time is yours. Honorable Rector of Universitas Pancasila, Professor Dr. Editut Hendratno SH MSc FCB ARB, Honorable Speakers, Dr. Chun Wai Mei of Shanghai Jiao Tong University, China, Dr. Changi Setia Budi of National Central University, Taiwan. Professor Dr. Henny Rahmawati of Institute Technology Bandung, Indonesia. Professor Dr. Evinora Anwar of Universitas Pancasila, Jakarta, Indonesia. Dr. Chun Fugo of University Science Malaysia from Malaysia. Dear oral and poster presenter, dear colleagues, and dear committee. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It is an honor and privilege for me to welcome all of you, the honorable speakers and participants from the various universities and institutions to attend this conference. Furthermore, we are so delighted to present the fifth international conference on pharmaceutical nanotechnology with the theme application of nanotechnology in drug cosmetic and herbal medicine. I realize that you have been fully dedicated to development of pharmaceutical nanotechnology as the development of the cosmetic and herbal industry has now become an important sector that is pretty reliable to contribute greatly to value of national and international export, and it can encourage worldwide economic growth. In addition, the conference could generate a productive dialogue among scientists in enriching their knowledge and expertise in nanotechnology. Moreover, the conference provides a valuable opportunity for networking between institutions. I am so pleased to note that the Faculty of Pharmacy, Universitas Pancasila can cooperate with other institutions and other countries. 
We do expect to hold this conference again next two years and also elected that delegated coming from various occupations are also in attendance in the challenging event. In particular, the, the speaker have Shanghai, China, Taiwan, Malaysia, and ITB who are now present the impact their expertise to the participants. Please allow me to highlight that the Faculty of Pharmacy, Universitas Pancasila is giving strong emphasis on the development of nanotechnology to develop associate researchers. Speaking about researchers, I would like to emphasize the importance of cosmetic and herbal industry development as the cosmetic industry and herbal medicine preparation can become the new spearhead for the national economy. I wish the participants have a very fruitful session. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Dr. Apotekar Shili Kumala, Magister Biomed. Excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen, right now we are going to listen to the welcoming speech and the opening remarks, which will be delivered by the Rector of Universitas Pancasila. And afterward, we would like to request the Rector to officially open this International Conference of Pharmaceutical Nanotechnology and Nanomedicine 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Dr. Editor Hendratno Sarjana Hukum Magister Science FCBRB. The time is yours. Thank you. Honorable speakers, Dr. Chun Wai Mai of Shanghai Chiao Tong University, China. Honorable speakers, Dr. Changi Setiabudi of National Central University, Taiwan. Professor Dr. Henny Rahmawati of Institute Teknologi Bandung yang saya hormati, Profesor Dr. Evio Nora Anwar of University Pancasila Jakarta, Dr. Chun Fugo of University Science Malaysia, Committee Chairman of the Conference, dear oral and poster presenter. Dear colleague, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, I would like to welcome all the participants joining this seminar. I'm very glad to welcome all of you. Then because I think the seminar, this seminar is very, very important. That's why I pleasure in welcoming all of you to this fifth international conference on pharmaceutical nanotechnology, nanomedicine, with the theme, application of nanotechnology in drugs, cosmetic, and herbal medicine. Thanks to Professor Dr. Sirli Kumala and the committee that have organized this important international event, valuable not only for University Pancasila, but also for the other universities and researchers. As mentioned by the committee, this year we are fortunate that the participants from various countries in Asia, such as China, Taiwan, and Malaysia, including Indonesia. There will be 26 oral presenters, 24 poster presenters, and general participants. The committee has also prepared some local and international journals for publishing the presented articles. I wish all participants are enjoying this conference and gaining valuable from this seminar. Have a good day. Finally, by saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, 
I declare that the conference is open. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Editor Hendratno Sarjana Hukum Magister Science FCBRB for the welcoming speech and this opening remarks. Before we proceed to the main agenda, with all due respect, we would like to invite the Rector of Universitas Pancasila, the Dean of Faculty of Pharmacy Universitas Pancasila, along with all of the speakers and the moderators to come up to the screen to have a photo session together. Our committee will take a screenshot in three, two, one. Okay, thank you for the Rector of Universitas Pancasila, the Dean of Faculty of Pharmacy of Universitas Pancasila, along with all of the speakers and the moderators. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are continuing our meeting to the next agenda, which is likely to hear the keynote speech, which will be delivered by Dr. Chun Wai Mai, CSI, PhD B Farm, and Mr. Changi Setia Budi, PhD, which will be moderated by Apotheker Kevin Ben Lawrence, RPH. First of all, please kindly allow me to introduce our moderator, Sifi. Kevin is a multilingual Asia Focus pharmacist, entrepreneur, and advisor managing business spanning several industries with special interest in healthcare and pharmaceutical industries. He started his career as a community pharmacist before venturing into the pharmaceutical industry as a sales and marketing executive. Kevin continued his career and passion in business by working in a top ranked Fortune Global 500 conglomerate where he and his team manage approximately 6 billion US dollar world of healthcare and pharmaceutical companies around the globe. He specializes in market research, strategic planning, merger and acquisition, operational management, and business development. Recently, he is working as an advisor for a leading fortune global 500 conglomerate, Marubeni Corporation, and as a partner for the largest health and medicines information company in Asia Pacific, MIMS PTA LTD. Kevin is also holding leadership position in several international and regional non-governmental organizations, contributing back to the society through empowerment, Director International Pharmaceutical Federation, Foundation for Education and Research in 2021 until 2023, Project Management Chairperson, Asian Young Pharmacist Group, in 2021 and 2022, Governing Council, Singapore Chamber of Commerce in 2021 until 2022. He is the first pharmacist to be fully certified by the Ministry of Health Singapore, Singapore Pharmacy Council, and Ministry of Health Indonesia, Indonesia Pharmacy Council. Thank you, MC, Ladies. for the kind... Oh, sorry, please. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Apotheker Kevin Ben Lawrence, RPH. The time is yours. Thank you, MC, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, faculty, uh, FFUP, for the uh, kind invitation and congratulations on the successful event. Uh, with uh, that, uh, I would like to introduce the first keynote speaker, Dr. Mai Chun Wai, a close friend of mine. Uh, MC, could you share the screen?
Yes. Thank you so much, MC and uh, the organizer. Uh, Dr. Mai is a postdoctoral researcher in the prestigious Shanghai Jiao Tong University, affiliated to Renshi Hospital in Shanghai. Dr. Mai has a great passion in identifying the biomarkers that drive tumorigenesis and cancer progression. His, his ultimate aim is to discover novel methods to target these cancers. Dr. Mai received numerous recognition, such as chartered scientists from the Royal Society of Chemistry, United Kingdom, and, Shang and Shanghai Foreign Young Scientists 2020. He has published more than 77 peer-reviewed papers with more than 100 citations and more than 200 cumulative impact factors. Dr. Mai has been contributing significantly to the pharmaceutical sciences profession through his role as the Pharmacological Chair, New Medicine Special Interest Group, International Pharmaceutical Federation, FIP. And uh, Dr. Mai, uh, welcome to uh, Indonesia, all the way from China, even though it's uh, virtual. Hi, thank, thank you, Kevin, for, for the kind introductions. Uh, so allow me to share my screen first. Okay, so can you all see the screen? No? Yes, we can. Okay. So uh, I have to be very thankful to um, everyone for inviting me, especially to the organizer, for choosing me to, to deliver this keynote speech um, in this conference. And, and today I will just walk you through a bit about my view about these applications of nanomaxins in cancers and therapeutics. So as the topic is a bit wide, so I will probably focus on one of the cancers that's currently I'm working on. So, um, so I'm actually working on pan pancreatic cancers. Um, this was the work that uh, done by my teens a few years ago. So we are quite glad to actually share with you on what we have discovered. So before we move on to what it, that we discovered late, related to nanotechnology, so perhaps I will just walk you through a little bit about pancreatic cancer. So pancreatic cancer, as you can see from the screens, is needed a, actually a magic bullet. Why we say is that they need a magic bullet is if you look through the, the prognosis and even um, the survival in the UK, um, you can see that only less than 1% of the people who actually can survive for more than 10 years upon diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Compared to other cancers, you definitely will see that this is actually very, very, very low. And it can actually lead to a problem that uh, the age of the survival is also very, very, very low. And with that uh, in mind that you can see, the diagnosis of the cases we take UK, for example, is about like 9,000 cases in a year, but the death rate is also about 9,200 per year. So for that particular reasons, we look at, sorry, we look at the, the comparisons with the other cancer. You can look, you can for example, uh, for breast cancers, you can see the survival is can actually up to quite high. It's about 70-80%. But in cervical cancer, it's also about 70-80%. But for pancreatic cancers, you can see the death rate is, is already 90% over percent. So for that particular reasons, we, we are interested to look at why pancreatic cancers have such a bad survival. Looking at the time today, we have very good medicines, we have a targeted therapy, we have immunotherapy, we have all sorts of the other agents that can actually target cancers effectively as seen by other solid tumor. But why pancreatic cancer? That it cannot be actually seen for the therapeutic and they cannot actually um, enjoy the therapeutic efficacy. And for that particular reasons, you if you look through the 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 actual survival as per se, five, you can also see that it's actually dropping as the age increasing. So that gives us a clue that um, as the tumor progress or, or a patient's getting older, there are some things that change in the patients that actually doesn't allow the patients to benefit from those therapeutics um, beneficial. And for that particular reasons, we also know that there are a lot of um, changes in the pancreatic cancer per se, that actually prevent them from actually enjoying those uh, therapeutic efficacy. And for that particular reason, we understand that 
one of the major challenge to target pancreatic cancer is the stromas that actually um, going around the whole solid tumor. And because of these stromas and um, tumor microenvironments that actually protect the tumor, and most of the chemotherapies or even immunotherapies that we have in mind is actually not beneficial because of that reason. And for that particular uh, um, reasons behind, we can actually see that the projections for pancreatic cancer is actually getting worse uh, as the years goes by. And for that reasons, we needed uh, some things to actually target pancreatic cancer. And as, as everyone knows that we, we use all the immunotherapy or chemotherapy, it doesn't seem to be working very well. And for that particular reason, our group start to turn into phytovaccines. So uh, as this Southeast Asia or Asia per se, we are actually quite blessed with a lot of um, natural products. As I would say is that this particular conference is also focusing on natural product. And I'm actually very glad that there are so many of the researchers or faculty or even students or postgraduate students are interested to actually explore the, the use of these um, plants and also the phytomexins that can be do with us. So just for the benefit of everyone, uh, phytomexins as defined is something that you use for plants or herbal for the purpose of killing of the ailments and uh, any of the beneficial uh, diseases that we are looking at. So in our team, we are particularly interested in something called palm oil. So just a show of hands, or perhaps you can use the chat group so, so, so that I know a little bit of the understanding of the audience. What do you know about palm oil? Perhaps you can quickly put in, in your um, chat. Sorry. Is the chat working? Uh, yes. Mm. Yeah, uh, because I, I can't see any of this chat. Yep, okay. Uh... Participants, uh, could you share uh, your thoughts on palm oil uh, mm. or minyak sawit? <laughs> we uh, call minyak it in sawit, the... yes. Yes, in Indonesia, it's called minyak sawit. What, what, what do you have in mind? Like, uh, if, have you come across this palm oil in Indonesia? Perhaps uh, I just want to get an audience uh, uh, understandings about palm oil before we move on to, to a bit more discussions about our, our group. Or perhaps, Kevin, have you come across on any of these palm yes. oil products? <laughs> yes, in fact, I'm actually uh, doing a bit of business on uh, palm oil plantation. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, okay, uh, that's good. So, there is uh, a lot of it in, in many parts of Indonesia, especially Kalimantan. And I think uh, there was one point in time where the, we, are in, we Indonesians are quite famous for contributing to the haze. <laughs> <laughs> that's another controversial issue we perhaps we should stay away from that but but yeah. that's good that, that there's the interest of um, palm oil is also lies in, in Indonesia so let, let's just move on into the, the active ingredients of the palm oil so as you you perhaps those who are working on palm oil research will know that the major active ingredients will be tocotrienol so those chemists will probably be very interested to look at these structures and as you can see, they, 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 another name to call it is probably the vitamin E. And you can see the alpha tocotrienol, beta tocotrienol, gamma tocotrienol, and the delta tocotrienol. And these are the active ingredients that is laid inside palm oil. That's why in, in Malaysia, especially those who have very close collaboration with Malaysian Palm Oil Board, as uh, one of my core researchers, we're working on the project that I'm going to share with you. And we, we're particularly interested in this particular um, palm oil because of their, they have very rich of this uh, tocotrienol, whether it's alpha, beta, or gamma, or delta. And there are a lot of research that already been working on the particular active ingredient. For example, if you go through the databases of the PubMed, um, you can actually see a lot of studies already done on alpha tocotrienol, or beta tocotrienol, or gamma tocotrienol on cancer. So I'm not going to focus on too much on these active ingredients because um, you, you perhaps already come across some of those in the paper. But I, what I'm going to draw your attention to the other types of the trochotrienols, which is in Malaysia, the Malaysian Palm Oil Board is particularly interested in an extract of, the, we call it uh, tocotrienol rich fractions. So it's actually the combinations of alpha, beta, gamma, and the delta. In, in a particular ratio of their interest. 
So these particular extracts, you, you can treat it as a, a plant extracts, as it's not the active ingredients that we have per se. So you, you can actually have a mixture of them. So the, the questions of delivering these extracts become very tricky. For those of you who work on plant extract will probably agree with me that you can't just take the extract itself. And the biggest problem will be that our digestive system will actually break them. And we, can, we may not be able to extract, uh, absorb them properly because they come in the extract form. So you may have to need some things to actually protect them from before our intestinal system will break them. That's one question. The second question is how could you make sure that all these extracts will be able to take in by the tumor? Let's say we want to target the cancer. So our tumors, as I already mentioned at the very beginning, for example, pancreatic cancer, they have a very thick stroma sections that actually prevent them to actually uh, ex accept this kind of extract or the, the, the tocotrienol. So that's why most of the study will actually show that they are not really too active. If you look at the particular structures, you also can agree with me that they are a particularly long fatty acid or, or hydrocarbon chain. So because of that reasons, you actually have in hydro hydrophobic cities that, that become another issues for delivery drugs. And for that particular reasons, our group will actually look into um, how we can actually packaging them and deliver this uh, tocotrienol rich fraction. And if you look at clinical trials, and as I mentioned before, there are many of the clinical trials that are already going around like tocotrienol. And there are also some of the active ingredient um, completed in 2016s and some of the trials are still going on. So these are the interests of the tocotrienol, but you can see there's no, no one is particularly looking at the extract or they are probably looking at most of the active ingredient. So the, the question is, where, where is the, the gold jacks in, in terms of the, the phytomaxins? So and it's international per se, I'm sure you're aware what is gold jack. So it's actually one of the rider apps that actually delivers you from one place to another place. So in terms of phytomaxins, where is this gold jack? Or where is these carriers who actually deliver the phytomaxins to, to the cancer? So we've been searching for a way and I believe that our groups have actually explored a method called the nanomaxin, which is the target or the focus of today's conference. So just to put everybody in the same page, um, nanomaxins will actually define as something that actually with the physical dis um, dimensions less than or equals to 100 nanomolar, nanometer. Sorry. So our groups will actually at first were looking at these uh, four particular nanomaxins delivery methods. Um, you may actually look at the particular reference that we put down. It's actually a review paper that done by our group. So if you want to know a little bit more details about these four types of the nanomaxins, you may actually look through this particular paper. It's open access, so, so you shouldn't be a problem to get the paper. But to our today's discussions, we will focus on niosomes, which is a bilayer vesicles. Um, using the non-ionic uh, surfactants and cholesterol. So, so if you look at the particular uh, pictures on the left, you can see that they're actually rounded by a bilayer. So which means that it's actually a good thing to actually trap those who have hydrophobic. But at the same time, if you have another drug which is hydrophilic, you can also deliver both at the same time. So that becomes an ideal because as I just um, look, uh, show it to you, tocotrienols have a very long hydrocarbon change which contribute to the hydrophobicity and our interest is to deliver another drugs together with this uh, tocotrienol rich fraction so um so our interest is to deliver gemcitabine gemcitabine is actually an hydrophilic drugs that currently being used in pancreatic cancer as a first line treatment so if you come across any pancreatic cancer patient the, they probably would be given gemcitabine as the first drug of chemotherapy to actually suppress the, the tumor. But the wonderful things about gemcitabine is um, we don't know actually the mechanism of actions. We just know that it could improve the quality of life for the patient. But the problem with hydrophilic drug is they can actually be, be cleared away very fast also by the body. And pancreatic cancer being a tumor, it can also repel the hydrophilic drug. So for that particular reasons, we add in gemcitabines together our tocotrienol rich fractions and we're packaging them into a nanomaxins carrier, which is the niosomes that we are interested in. 
So you, you can also look at this particular paper, uh, nanomaxins that I coded below. It's a paper that we, we summarize all the findings today that I'm going to discuss with you. So in case if you lost me in between, you may also check through this particular paper. We'll have a very detailed methodology and the results that we, we already found. So just to walk you through, we actually try two particular methods, the Hanjani Vila methods. The other one is a foam hydration method. So if you look at this particular uh, transmission electron microscopy, you can see that the pictures of the, 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 the niosomes is actually less than 100 nanometer, which is the, the, the definitions of, um, uh, of nanomaxins. So in terms of comparing Hanjami Mila method, which is the above and the firm hydration method, we kind of prefer the firm hydration methods to deliver the gemcitabine and tocotinol refraction. But looking at the size itself is not enough for us to, to confirm that we, this is a preferred method. So we actually look through all the other characterizations, including the, the zeta potentials and also the, the entrapment efficiency. So how much of the drugs that can be entrapped. So we, we use the entrapment methods of like different ratios of the tocotrienol refraction with the gemcitabine. And you can see that um, the, the, the two methods that we use to prepare the niosomes have slightly difference in terms of the, the entrapment efficiency and also the zeta potential. Um, slightly beneficial in terms of the film hydration method as we expected from the size that we seen from the trans-electron microscopy. So looking at the entrapment efficiency, that gives us an idea at that, uh, how good the drugs is actually maintained as an isom because you don't want the drugs to put on the shelf for about like four months later, everything will just disintegrate. So we look at the shelf after uh, at four months uh, at the room temperature, at the temperature of four degrees, which is like in the fridge. And you can see the B1 method, which is com uh, completed using the firm hydrations. Um, they actually degraded as the time go by. But the degradations are, is also uh, a little bit better in terms of gemcitabine compared to the tocotrienol refraction. So that gives us an idea that um, the drugs may not work actually at the four months, but the about two months, you can still see about the, the good in terms of the entrapment efficiency. So looking at this, um, although we are not too happy with the entrapment efficiency, but this is actually the best formulations that we can manage to produce at the time. So we actually proceed with this B1 formulations, which is the entrapment efficiency of um, this much, and uh, proceeding to uh, treatments in, in pancreatic cancer cell. So we use cell lines as a method to actually test the efficacy. So for those of you who may not be too familiar with cell line, cell line is actually coming from a tumor. Uh, let's say pancreatic cancer patients, they contribute a tumor. And from the tumor, we isolated the cells. And from that cells, we grow them in a cultures that actually homogeneously in, in the lab. So we have four types of pancreatic cancer cell line. So the PANS 1005, SW1990, SPC1s, or BXPC3. So we tested these cells with gemcitabine alone, uh, tocotrienol risk fractions alone in, in the niosome, as well as the uh, tocotrienol risk fraction, gemcitabine, and together in an entrapment that we need like the B1 formulation. So if you look at this particular slide, you can actually see that the, 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 the entrapment efficiency in the niosome per se is actually having the best uh, efficacy. So compared to those who are just using gemcitabines alone or uh, tocotrienol rich fractions alone. So that gives us an idea of our formulations is actually working. And it's also consistent throughout the four uh, pancreatic cancer. So we look into the microscopics to actually confirm that um, whether this effect is actually what we see in the viability. And also, we also want to understand that how good these uh, niosomes were actually able to kill the cells and whether they will actually generate more of the apoptosis, which is the programmed cell death or uh, how the cells actually die. So if you look at the gemcitabine plus tocotrienol refractions in the niosome per se, the, the, the morphology of the cells uh, seems to be an, in, in the apoptotic type of the cells, which means that they are still rounded. They are not like necrotizing or, or they're bursting out. Because in, in, in the tumor treatments, the biggest problem when, when the cells become 
like like burst or or they're releasing all the other dead cells, it will actually contributing to another toxic environment. We may be actually contributing another problems to the to the to the patients. So we wanted to to them to actually stay as much as they apoptotic so so that our other immune systems will come in to actually clear these particular cells away. So it, from the microscopic, you can also see that uh, gemcitabine plus uh, the tocotrienol rich fractions in the niacin per se will actually contribute to, to the biggest, uh, how to say, the, the, the biggest efficacy and, as we what it expected and compared to the other method. So this is the, the, the formulations that we are quite comfortable with. But of course, uh, a lot of people will actually uh, argue with me saying that this, this may not be the best entrapment efficacy. And that's why the team is still working on improving the entrapment efficacy of the GenCW and the endocrinal rich fraction so that we can actually deliver this in, in a better method. So... Uh, I will end this presentation by, by saying that all the works that you can see from here is, is not contributed by me alone. It's actually by a team of the people. So I have a very good uh, formulation scientist who are working in the Malaysian Palm Oil Board who actually work on most of the, the entrapment uh, efficacies and also the formulations and the ratios. And my master students were actually working on most of the characterizations and the testing. And the, the bio, bio essays that we come up with to, to, to first screen off the formulations is, is the in vitro method. And of course, the drawback for in vitro method is we may not be able to see the pharmacodynamic or the pharmacokinetics of the whole niosomes. So the next plan is to go into the animal studies, the moments that we have, the, the best formulations that we are interested in. So with that, uh, I will be happy to take any questions or if if anyone will have any questions. Uh, maybe we can uh, follow up on the Q&A later, Dr. Mai. Oh, uh, oh so, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mai. Uh, just to summarize, it's quite interesting the fact that you can use palm oils in the form of diazomes to support the delivery of medicines direct mm. to the pancreatic cancer. And yeah. uh, the fact that, you know, in Indonesia, we are, pre one, we are, I would say that we are the largest palm oil producer in the world, but we are mm. using it to fry things. <laughs> it's quite interesting that, uh, you know, we can use uh, the things that use uh, for our food, you know, for uh, frying mm. uh, to be used in medicine. So this is really, really something that uh, is quite interesting. I think it, in, in Malaysia, they, they, we also use the palm oil in cooking set. But, but I think the, the red palm oil is the ones that they, they were telling me is not so tasty. It's the taste is not too acceptable to, to the public. So... So for that particular reason, um, they, they also produce these tocotrienol rich fractions. Uh, this, this is actually a, a method that they, they, they process the, the palm oil and that's why they come up with the tocotrienol rich fractions. So of, of course, I'm, I'll be happy to work on those Indonesia's uh, palm oil if any of the people who are interested to, to actually work on this. Thank you so much, Dr. Mai, for the comment. Uh, and right now, uh, we'll be moving on to the Next speaker, mm. uh, uh, Dr. Changi, oh, Pak Changi. Uh, MC, can I get your assistance to uh, show uh, uh, Dr. Changi's uh, uh, CV? Thank you, Dr. Mai. Uh, and uh, please take a rest first while we move on to the next speaker. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. So we have doc uh, Dr. Changi Stiabudi from the Department of Chemistry, National Central University of Taiwan, or uh, Guota Guoli, uh, uh, what's this? Uh, 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 Guoli Zhongyang uh, Dashi. Uh, yeah, Guoli Yeah, Guoli Zhongyang Dashi. Yeah, Guoli Dashi. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Changi Stiabudi uh, is actually uh, the 2018, uh, uh, received a 2018 CTCI Science and Technology Research uh, Award. Uh, he was also the 2017 NCU Presidential Scholarship Award for Doctoral Student issued by uh, National Central University Taiwan. So uh, Dr. Changi has been spending quite a long time in Taiwan. So yes, I bet right. he's very, very fluent in Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 我是你好. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, 
thank you so much for joining us all the way from Taiwan. And, uh, yeah, uh, you know, we are very, very interested to hear more about your presentation, which yeah. will be focusing on uh, uh, the tailoring size tunable ultra small magnetic nanoparticles in surface modified mesophorous silica as catalyst nano reactor for production of aniline derivatives and its perspective as unique nano carrier in herbal drugs. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, that's uh, the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Changi. Uh, so thank you very much for Kevin on the nice introduction. And can you, can you, can you get the sales skill? Uh, the committee okay. help too. Okay, not yet. Oh, uh, uh, Dr. Changi, would you like me to share yours, uh, the screen for you or? Yeah, sure. Okay. 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 Yes, so I start that now. So thank you very much for, 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 for Mr. Kevin for the nice introduction. And then good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, distinguished guests, distinguished professor and participants. Uh, I'm Chang Siabudi. Uh, as has been uh, uh, introduced by Kevin, I'm from Department of Chemistry. National Central University, Taiwan. Yeah, I'm Indonesian, but I live in Taiwan for uh, pursuing my uh, master, uh, PhD, and also postdoctoral. So, because my background is uh, more in the material science, so today I would like to um, share to you about how to prepare the tunable uh, magnetic nanoparticle in nano level size, uh, so, uh, confined in the surface mm -hmm. modified. Uh, mesoporosilica and its application as the catalysis nanoreactor in the production of aniline derivatives, which is an important intermediate in the pharmaceutical industry, and a little uh, brief uh, perspective as unique nanocarrier in a herbal drugs. So, uh, okay. Wait a second, I want to next my, yes. Okay, so uh, let me introduce about my school. Uh, National, I think everyone here is quite familiar with Taiwan because it's famous, uh, because of famous for the drinks, for the foods, for the delicious, and also the delicious food, and also the drama series of Meteor Garden. And uh, my school, National Central University, is located in the north part, or northern part of Taiwan, and it's, uh, well known as the most beautiful campus in Taiwan with a good environment for study and doing research. So we are welcoming every st uh, any student from Indonesia or from abroad to, to have uh, pursue the uh, post, uh, postgraduate study in Taiwan, especially in National Central University. And okay, back to the topic. Okay, next, yeah. Next, yeah. And, um, this is my today's outline, and uh, we compress of this following part. And next, well, global warming uh, from the massive uh, industrialization and human activity, from pollution to overpopulation, create a significant and controllable emission uh, of greenhouse gases. And then th the challenge is that can the nanotechnology answer this question? And also next. And also the uh, significant, I mean, the serious threat from the, from, from the environment, from the massive industrialization, from textile, leather, paint, plastic, paper, and printing, create a significant a concern in the environmental problem in which uh, it is toxic, carcinogenic, and a uh, hazard for the living species in bio, body water. So the challenge is, uh, is it possible uh, to use the nanotechnology to overcome this problem? So this is some of my publication in the how to use the, how to utilize the CO2 uh, become the source for the uh, uh, formation of methane and useful chemical, uh, how to remove the organic contaminants by using uh, 
uh, redux, chemical reduction and also uh, catalytic uh, dye reduction to produce the uh, aniline derivatives with this important intermediate in pharmaceutical industry. And next, uh, yes, even we can use the uh, nanotechnology to uh, reduce the Anthropogenic, anthropogenic gases like toluene in the atmosphere to more or less uh, anthropogenic. Uh, and then we can use the product of CO2 to, to prepare or to become the source and the preparation or in the production of methane or any useful chemical. And then next. Yes, nanotechnology is uh, close to, is identical with the nanomaterial. So when we have the Nano, uh, when we have the material that lies between one to 100 nanometer, uh, it, is, uh, it is very, very small that we cannot see from the naked eyes. So you can take, for example, how small is it? You can take one of single hair, of one of single of your hair, and then the diameter of hair is about 100, uh, nano, 100 micron, which is, you have to divide to 10 million part of your single hair to get the very small uh, nano scale material. And in the nano level, in, in current research, uh, we have many of uh, structure, many of uh, architecture like nano pores, nano holes, and uh, nano digs, and even uh, nano sphere, et cetera, and nano, nano architecture, any other nano architecture. So, and then next, and then next, yeah. Why do people make things smaller? Because when we reduce the size to the small part, we will have the surface, very high surface area. And the, the surface uh, to volume ratio is really high and it's uh, provide the more active side of surface area to, to have a possible chemical reaction with the target or with the substrate molecule. And in this, in this uh, nano level, the, the material has a dramatical change in the physical or chemical properties when compared to their bulk uh, material, their bulk counterpart. So, but, okay, next. Uh, but it's not simply about making things smaller. In the nano world, we have many questions. How small is it? How about the shape? Because it's, it's very tiny, we cannot see by naked eyes. So we need a really, really high, uh, powerful tools to prove how, about this question. And also in the nano level, uh, the metal is really sensitive to the external force, like moisture, surface oxidation, and thermal or like industrial pressure. And the most important is the a stability issue like aggregation, sintering, or Oswald ripening would lead to the reduced stability and um, diminish the physical or optical properties. So sometimes we need to we need stabilizing agent or capping agent to protect the nanoparticle for serious from serious aggregation. But but the the presence of this uh, capping agent is sometimes hinders the direct interaction with this, the target molecule. So it will affect the uh, performance during the application. Okay, next. And for example, this is my experiment. I want to make the freestanding silver nanorod on the nickel, uh, on the silver surface. And after a couple of days, the, the Silver is aggregated to the serious, uh, serious, uh, uncontrolled and uh, ununiform shape. With this, decrease the surface area and and affect the physical, chemical, or optical properties and create undesirable effect during the application. And then next, okay. Well, so we need the something. Uh, support to, to, to stabilize or to protect the nanomaterial from aggregation. And we have recently in the porous material, we have three kinds of uh, porous uh, 
classes like micropore when you have when you your pore is less than two nanometer mesopore is when your uh pore size is about two to fifty nanometer and macropore is when your pore size is more than fifty nanometer and it is really uh i mean really promising candidate to to stabilize the not only nanoparticle but it can stabilize the enzyme for the drug delivery and for catalysis, gas storage, and, and energy storage because of its provide high surface area and then high porosity, uniform and adjustable pore, pore size, high diffusity and well isolated environment for growth of nanomaterial. And then next. Well, for example, in FDU-12, it has in a one frame of at U12, they have surface area of 900 meters square. You can imagine that in one gram, you have the surface area of more than two times of basketball court or more than three times of tennis ball court. That is really, really promising. With this high surface area, you can put, you can absorb or you can immobilize high amount of enzyme, high amount of protein or even drugs. Yes, and next. Yes, in the environmental issue, uh, natural aromatics uh, is uh, always is a common common organic the major organic contaminant produced from the uh, industrial wastewater or uh, sanitary sewage, and it is harmful to the uh, environment because it is toxic, carcinogenic, and the efforts to remove or to use this uh, compound is uh, through the hydrogenation, through the hydrogenation reaction to produce the amino aromatic compound, which is a useful intermediate in the many kind of industry like fragrance, pharmaceutical, pesticide, fertilizer, and also dyes. And then, and then, so the question is, is it possible for us using the nanotechnology to make drugs for pollutant? The answer is yes. We can use the pollutant like nitrophenol or natural aromatic compound to, to produce the aminophenol and then for the use as the intermediate for pharmaceutical industry in the, pro, uh, in the production of paracetamol uh, through the acetylation of uh, paraaminophenol. And even we can use the dyes, the dyes to produce, uh, we can use the dyes to produce the aniline derivative through the uh, reduction of azo uh, groups in the dyes. So it is, it is very promising uh, to make, to use, to use or to remove the contaminants to useful material, especially amino phenol aminophenol group for the intermediate in paracetamol or pharmaceutical industry. However, the reaction is not easily happen, it's not easily occur. Its reaction takes long time. So that's, we really need what we call as catalyst. Yes, catalyst are, well, in the, in, in the insert of uh, effective and affordable catalyst nickel nickel uh, metal is is considered of is is considered is considered as the good alternate in the preparation of catalyst because it has low cost avail really available it has good magnetic properties which is important you, you in in catalysis with the reusability or recyclability is an important issue so that's the separation of catalysts after they're, they're used during the reaction uh, effectively and, and then you can um, take it again and then we can recover easily with effective and fast uh, approach. And it also has, it's famous for hydrogenation, hydrogenation properties like in the, like in the hydrogenation of nitrophenol or hydrogenation of um, um, furanic aldehydes. However, at the nanoscale, the nickel nanoparticle, it has a uh, that uh, is easy to aggregate and uh, 
have and proceed the sintering and unstable uh, create an unstable effect. So yeah, next. So that uh, we need the support. We need the support to uh, immobilize, to stabilize, or to encapsulate the nanoparticle from the serious aggregation. For and as I will introduce about the SPA sixteen here. SPA sixteen is a is is few as is 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 few can be few as the ideal support because it it is a fascinating family of 3D order silica with gets like mesopore in which uh, the S mesopore in the PCC structure has eight nickel it has eight nickel uh, mesopore in which connected is other so you can send the some you can the proceed the molecular diffusion from all of uh, direction okay next okay and it also has tuning properties you can tune the gate size and also you can tune the entrance port by uh, uh, by the design of during the synthesis or by the hydrothermal treatment and sometimes in the in the uh, absorption or immobilization of large uh, molecule large large bioactive molecule like enzyme and the large pore is uh, sometimes uh, sometimes preferable because it need a, a larger larger open pore to to facilitate to accommodate the the diffusion and also the absorption of the active molecule. Next, yes, we, we talk about the three D connected channel. When we compare to the two D, it's only like uh, in SPA 15 material, it has only single diffusion, uniform uh, in a hexagonal mesopore that, that the material is only a single diffusion. And compared to this SPA 15 material, it is few that the 3D connected channel with multi-directional pore system is likely to be more resistant to local pore blockades than the channel pores. So in in this case, uh, how to in this case, uh, we would like to also uh, doing the surface functionalization of uh, SPA sixteen using um, the COO eight uh, functional group in which the introduction of uh, in which the uh, synthesis of uh, SPA sixteen with COO eight functionality was was uh, conducted by the in situ functionalization by the co-condensation co co of TOS and CES at the same time with the presence of chloronic, uh, chloronic surfactant, uh, P123 and F127. And after we get the, the uh, support, and then we would like to introduce nickel, nickel uh, active uh, material to, to be incorporated or to be encapsulated on this uh, active active uh, support. We know that at the, we do at the high pH, because at the high pH, the COOH functional group will be deprotonated and create a negatively charged with, with this uh, short bind zeta potential at the high pH, you, have, you will have the uh, negatively charged, negatively charged um, surface in which it, uh, favorable to absorb or to have columbic interaction with nickel uh, cation in which have the positive charge. So with this, uh, with combine this uh, dual benefit effects from the confinement oh, and too. confinement of the case type and the surface functionality to then effectively tune the nickel nanoparticle size. When we do it at a lower pH, there is no green precipitate uh, appears here because there is no um, nickel uh, species, nickel uh, cation absorbed on the on the support. And then next, well, how to uh, and then how to uh, prove that uh, our support has the uh, organic functionality. So NMR and solid state NMR is the powerful, powerful technique to 
to understand the surface chemistry in our uh, support system. From this, from this, uh, I will not as I will not speak in detail, but from this uh, NMR spectra, we can we can uh, conclude that the uh, COOH functionality has been success successfully um, successfully embed on the uh, silica uh, silica frameworks and. Using the silicon NMR, mass NMR, we can get then the level of organic organic uh, pendants, which is uh, about 20.3 percent, and it is uh, um, consistent with the, I mean, with the uh, initial mixture during the, the synthesis. And then the next, and also we can prove the in we can prove the successful functionalization use FTRR in which the presence of CO and uh, CO uh, vibrational band and also the CS uh, bending band in the in the wavelength of 1,700 around 1,700 and around uh, 1,400 is uh, clearly indicate that the uh, COOS functionality has been success successfully embedded on the framework of silica. And then after the incorporation of nickel, the, the peak, I mean the absorption peak uh, related to CO and CH bending is disappear because uh, due to the high temperature reduction uh, and, and degradation of the uh, COH during the uh, metal during the metal uh, formation. But if you don't want to lose the COH group, you can do the chemical reduction so that you that you can uh, keep the COOH while you still have a change to uh, to produce or to prepare the nickel nanoparticle inside the pore. And the next well, I will not speak here in detail, but okay, can you make it? Next, is it? Uh... Yeah, next. Oh, okay, I think you can. Yes, from the TEM image, we can hear uh, proof that the nanoparticle is highly dispersed with, uh, with a very uh, narrow uh, particle size distribution. In which your nanomaterial is lies between 2.6 nanometer to 5.1 nanometer, the particle size increase with the increasing of nickel loading content. And from the high resolution TEM image, uh, the magnified TEM and also the SAED pattern clearly indicate that the highly crystalline nickel is uh, is uh, have the is uh, successfully. Uh, encapsulated or successfully supported on the SPA16C and the ATX elemental mapping showing that the uh, material consists of uh, silicon, oxygen, and nickel. And next, okay. And, and if we don't have the COS functionality, we, you can see in that we don't have any tuning properties in which the particle size is keep constant around four nanometer, which is different with when we have the COS functionality. So uh, the importance of uh, functionalization with COS is not only uh, govern the electrostatic uh, electrostatic interaction to, uh, between the support and the nickel, but also it can tuning the particle size from two, around two nanometer to six to, to five nanometer. And the next, okay. So here I would like to compare, doing the comparative study on, on how the nickel nanoparticle uh, do the hydrogenation reaction in the two kind of distinctive, distinctive pores, so-called uh, SPA15C and S16C with two different uh, mesostructure. And the next, yes. So, if, as I mentioned before, that SPA16 is a, 
called channel-like channel-like the missile structure. It has a one single cap length, and the SPS sixteen is a a three dimensional. It has interconnected and uh, multi directional multi directional port network system. So we would like to see here that which one of these uh, nano structure or which has of this uh, port port system will uh, affects the performance of nickel during the catalysis of uh, nitrophenol to aminophenol. And the next, yes, here. I, I think uh, I have discussed this before that it is the COS is uh, successfully uh, embedded or successfully uh, supported on the successfully uh, functionalized on the surface of silica frameworks. And next. Well, when we compare with uh, wet angle XRD signal of two nickel catalysts in two different pore system, in which the particle size in the SPS 15C is, is uh, slightly higher, slightly uh, larger as compared to the nickel in SPA 16C at any doping level. It means that the SPA 16 with the cubic port, cubic port system with multi-directional and cast type um, muscle port system, it uh, more effectively, uh, more uh, efficient to, to uh, encapsulate or to uh, confine the nickel nanoparticle during its uh, crystal growth. And next, well, uh, it also followed by the the small angle is RD, but while the the peak is around one one oh oh is a uh, peak of the hexagonal uh, hexagonal P six mm uh, uh, space uh, space uh, six uh, the peak around one zero zero decrease significantly because of the feeling the because of the are filled with the nickel nanoparticle and some degradation during the nickel during the nickel growth at high temperature. And also it's followed by the decrease in the surface area and also poor volume. Next. And on decrease in the surface area and also poor volume with the increase of uh, nickel amount in SPA 15C and also FPA 16C. Yes, next. Well, from the TEM image, we clearly clearly see here that the parents of SPA16C and S16C is consists of a high high regular and uniform or size uh, with a channel like and also with a cube missile port system, and the nickel nanoparticle are highly dispersed with a narrow process distribution. And the, it takes uh, met elemental mappings, showing that the the catalyst is mainly consists of silicon, oxygen, and nickel. And the SAD pattern and also the magnified um, SAD pattern and magnified uh, high resolution TEA image showing that the showing that the nickel is highly crystalline and with the with the characteristic or finger D11 spacing about 0 0.2 nanometer, which is consistent to the lattice constant or the spacing calculated from the XRD spectrum. And next, okay, there's no morphology change when you after you put the nickel nanoparticle. Okay. So you will see the surface uh, chemistry oxidation. You will, you will uh, I mean, uh, how to understand the oxidation state in, in, the, in our catalyst that you need to do the XPS measurement. And it, the catalyst consists of uh, nickel metal and nickel oxide, and nickel oxidase, and nickel two plus and nickel three plus with the presence of satellite indicating that the Indicating that the uh, nickel is partially oxi oxi oxidized 
during the sample treatment because as we know that SPS is uh, the SPS is the uh, very sensitive, very surface sensitive uh, analysis. So that's the partial the partial oxidation by the uh, by the atmosphere or by the uh, amb air in amb ambience is uh, can be happen. So with and also with the magnetic properties, we can then easily separate the catalyst from the liquid phase. That is very useful during the reuse during the reuse or recycle of the catalyst after the reaction uh, after the reaction. Next, so in the comparative study, uh, it seems it it clearly see here that the nickel in SPS sixteen C perform a higher a higher catalytic activity as compared to the nickel in SPS 16 c in which the catalyst in which the reaction can be uh, have can be proceed only within eight minutes as compared to the uh, SPS 15 c with its uh, mid longer reaction time about 20 minutes and we from the catalytic cat, uh, catalytic study we uh, because of the concentration of the NAPS4, I mean the poro hydrate is uh, larger than the, is uh, much higher than the concentration of uh, substrate of NP. So the reaction is bilanced in the cycle first order reaction in which from the slope, we can, uh, we can then uh, get the information about the red constant. So from this, from this, uh, Plot of uh, natural log of ATA0 first time, we can see that the uh, SPA16, nickel in SPA16 is more effective to more effective or more uh, have a good catalytic properties as compared to the nickel in SPA15C. And I think I need to, yes, I need to. Skip this part. Next, okay. From this table, we can we can then uh, we can then uh, conclude that the nickel in SPS sixteen have a good have a better uh, accurate constant accurate constant and the and the better catalytic uh, parameter as compared to the nickel in SPA fifteen C and also nickel in SiO two. Yes, what is the reason? Uh, what is the reason behind the uh, good performance of uh, nickel in SPA sixteen? Because uh, we know that the uh, we, we know that the uh, heterogeneization of four NP to four AP in in the catalyst metal system is relies on the um, is less on the Substrates absorption and also electron transfer from the garner to the acceptor. So when you have the nanoparticle with less blockage and a small particle size, you will have more uh, active site to produce the hydride in which in which uh, responsible to the next hydrogenation to to then uh, yield uh, the natural soil and heterosyl amine compound and then further to get the product of four amino phenol. So that the nano four NP reduction can be more effectively performed by the unblocked uh, nickel nanoparticle with small particle size and also is of this is of the accessibility to the reactant and then more active set to push it as transfer induced by heterogeneity. And then also from the support system that the this case like with multi-directional port network system with interconnected port system, uh, it is of a high accessibility to the reactant to diffuse from all direction as compared to the one diffusion in SPA 15, and thus enhance the effectiveness on the reduction of for nitrophenol. Yes. So 
the reusability or recyclability is important issue in the catalysis in the practical application of catalyst because uh, when because after you it is expensive I think catalyst is expensive and you need to recover it to to be reused for the next uh, reaction and from from this uh, diagram we, we can see that uh, a less uh, decrease in activity for the nickel in SPA 16C as compared to the nickel in SPA 16, 15C because of the static and electro, electrostatic interaction play a role in the stabilization of nickel nanoparticle which avoid a serious aggregation of nickel nanoparticle during the liquid-based hydrogenation. And then with the, uh, with the magnetic properties, the, 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 the catalysts are easily recovered by external magnetic. And next. Okay, this is a different kind of uh, substrate, like natural, two natural phenol and two natural aniline were used to produce the, another kind of anilin derivative, so-called to aminophenol or orthophenylene diamine. And still that the nickel in SPS 16 showing a higher catalytic activity as, the, as compared to the nickel in SPA 15C. Next. So an effort, we, we do the uh, we do the experiment to to make a much better catalyst by doping of silver in the nickel crystal and, and then use as, as the super catalyst for production of anilin derivatives from the toxic natural aromatic in which the reaction only takes place around 60, 60 seconds, only one minute. That is really, really fast. So, next, okay. So the concept is, the concept is similar that in which the silver and nickel are simultaneously uh, absorbed on the support by the wet impregnation technique and then followed by the thermal reduction at high temperature. And next, and yes, next. And the, uh, it is, uh, as I explained before that the, I think, uh, that the uh, CO is, is uh, important, important uh, organic pendants that that can uh, effectively to uh, absorb the both silver and nickel. And then, yes, from I will not speak in detail from these uh, diagrams um, from this XRD or PET spec PET uh, isotherm curve. But uh, in, it is concluded that the silver, top, nickel are effectively confined in the, are successfully and effectively confined in the SPA 16 with the cubic mass of silica. And, and, and uh, because the silver nanoparticle, uh, silver nickel nanoparticle are, sorry. Okay, yes. The silver nanoparticle, the silver crystal is is uh, larger than slightly larger than nickel. So the the incorporation of silver in nickel will lead to the decrease in the uh, dispersing or uh, and also the lattice parameter of the nickel uh, lattice nickel crystal, and also followed by the reducing in the surface area, pore volume, and also in the gauge uh, size of the support. Yes, and uh, it is clearly shown here that the silver top nickel is is uh, effectively uh, stabilized as effectively confined in the in the cubic meter pore of SPA sixteen C, and it has a narrow pore size distribution about three nanometer, and the high magnified uh, resolution TEM, high magnified uh, TEM showing the highly crystalline of nickel with the Fingers D11 uh, spacing about 0 0.2. And the ETS mapping uh, proved that the, the catalyst consists of a small amount of uh, silver, nickel, and then uh, silicon and also oxygen. 
and there is no uh, morphological change during the incorporation of silver uh, dark nickel in SPA 16C. And next, okay, next. Yeah, with this uh, uh, magnetic properties, it, it is uh, the nano with this uh, magnetic properties, it is uh, proposed that uh, this catalyst is will be easily recover or will be easily uh, take after the several cycle reaction. And from the magnetization uh, diagrams here, the magnetic saturation decrease with the increase of silver silver loading content. And there is no significant uh, remanence or passivity uh, indicating that the material is a, a super paramagnetic behavior. Okay. Okay. You have another five yeah. more minutes to go. Okay, okay, I will take it faster. Okay. So from this diagram, from, from this uh, uh, absorption uh, spectra, uh, only take one minute of the silver nickel to proceed direction, which is much better as the uh, nickel and silver counterparts. So what is the reason behind this? Uh, what is the reason behind, behind this phenomena? Okay, next. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, next. Yeah, because the unique uh, electronic properties, the difference electronic negativity between the uh, silver and nickel create an electronic contrast, electron rich and electron poor side, in which the electron division uh, forms near the, atom, near the nickel atom by introduction of the silver atom and, it, and induce the electronic interaction of absorbed molecule and enhance the absorption capacity and generate hydrogen effectively. And the unique pore config, unique catch pore configuration also uh, help the diffusion of, of the substrate and the molecule from to and to all in the direction. So that's why the silver top nickel have a very a very uh, high catalytic activity as compared to their uh, monometallic counterpart. Okay, next. Okay, next. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, the silver top nickel also uh, have a performance in the reduction of two natrophenol and also two natural aniline to to produce two aminophenol and two and orthophenyl and Yes. So with this uh, case like uh, structure, uh, okay. Next. So with I I will yes. So. With this a uh, unique uh, structure with the guest light high surface area, we have done the uh, uh, absorption of uh, enzyme called papain, in which the uh, large is a large pore have large pore and we compare the large pore and uh, with the COOH and without COOH, in which the uh, large pore uh, SP, large pore uh, cubic mesopores with the COOH have a higher absorption capacity in the papain as compared to the uh, large pore silica without COOH. Okay. And with the interconnected pore, the magnetic properties, the tunable pore size, high surface area and pore volume, tunable particle size, and order pore structure with biocompatibility and surface functionality. This uh, magnetic in cats like mesopore is a few as an interesting and unique uh, unique material to to immobilize or immobilize the bioactive material. For example, I briefly okay. For example, I I briefly uh, introduced that the Christian Linder herbal drugs is. Uh, has become the herbal drug has become uh, famous because of the wide application to cure to a variety of diseases and less toxic effect and better therapeutic effect and also affordable. But the drawback is it is unstable in highly acidic pH or uh, drug level below and lead to the drug level below the therapeutic concentration. So here I propose that the uh, magnetic nanoparticle confined in the SPA 16 with the case like uh, cubic uh, mesopore system can be effectively uh, 
hard swap or can be effectively effectively loaded by the uh, active metal like curcumin from 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 the turmeric and also can be far to use as the uh, uh, cancer therapeutic uh, cancer chemotherapy uh, using the external magnetic to heat up the tumor cell effectively. Okay. And the conclusion I, with the multidirectional and interconnected port system, in the case like a space system is support. Uh, can control the blood nickel nanoparticle more effectively than the hexagonal SPF15C and the accumulative effects of the structural properties loading ammonia and ultra small size nickel nanoparticle top in case like for system of the nickel SPF16 catalyst lead to the higher catalytic performance in the reduction of natural iron to amino iron than just on the hexagonal channel system of the nickel in SPF15C then and the DOS the disorder system of the nickel SiO2 catalyst and the present catalyst are easily to be recovered for reuse purpose due to its magnetic properties associated with the nickel nanoparticle. And yes, the silver dope nickel nanoparticle uh, are highly active and easily recover recoverable with make them a uh, promising nanocatalyst for the heterogeneous uh, catalysis in the production of aniline derivatives. So thank you very much. Uh, I acknowledge for, for the nanocatalyst and high energy battery lab, Center of for General Education, Champion University, and Minister of Science and Technology, Taiwan, National Central University, and CTCI Science and Technology Foundation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Uh... Dr. Changi, for the very uh, nice uh, sharing on the, your research topic. It's very, very, uh, uh, what's that? Uh, it's very, uh, uh, very informative. And uh, frankly speaking, uh, it's very interesting how it can be incorporated into uh, uh, the practice in the future. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Yeah, so right now, uh, can we have the MC to pin the three... Uh, Myself, uh, Dr. Changi, and Dr. Mai, and uh, we will be taking some questions. Okay, so uh, yeah, okay, uh, we have a, a question first and foremost for Dr. Mai already. Okay, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mai, the first question is coming from Miss Farida. Uh, why did you choose niosome as carriers and not others? Thank you. Um, thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Farida, for the questions. Um, frankly speaking, uh. We actually tried a few other methods uh, in our lab, and it uh, seems like niosomes is uh, one that actually can incorporate the tocotrienol very effectively. Um, probably because of the tocotrienols have uh, the long fatty acids that, that I was mentioning to you all, and the entrapment efficiency uh, while we are using the other uh, nano formulations doesn't seem to be very promising. And at the end, we decided to go with a niosome. Um, that's the first reason. Of course, the second reason is our team, the, the PI who actually helped us on the nail formulation. Uh, her work is mostly on these niosomes uh, as, as the main expertise. So, um, and that's how the docotrinos and the niosomes work very well. So that's why we, we decided to focus on niosome. But uh, as I mentioned in the review paper, we actually looked through the literature's on the delivery method that other people are using to deliver tacotrinol. Actually, the other formulations is also established um, methods. Uh, so actually, you can actually explore it. But at the time we, we were looking into it, um, that's the best method that we have. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mai. Mm -hmm. uh, another two questions for Dr. Mai before we move on to mm -hmm. Dr. Changi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for Dr. Mai, uh, from uh, Ms. Gresty. Uh, doc, thank you, Dr. Mai, uh, for an, a very interesting and educative uh, education, uh, educational uh, presentation. Uh, Gresty is a doctoral student uh, in pharmacy from uh, University of Pancasila. Uh, she would like to ask about how can nanotechnology be used to improve cancer treatment? How can we estimate mm. the drug concentration at the cancer site? Mm. Currently, the nanotechnology has been in place to a lot of the chemotherapy as well. Like I just give you an example is doxorubicin um, is actually one of the chemotherapy drugs used in a lot of tumor. And they also already have a nanotechnology uh, formulations for doxorubicin. So in terms of delivery, um, it's actually quite a mature area. The question is what kind of delivery methods suit for what kind of drugs? 
the the problem when it comes to jam side is mm-hmm. the like I also show you in the, our slide. If you use nanosomes to deliver gem alone, it doesn't seem to be very effective as well. So the question is what nanoformulations and what kind of the drugs is useful for delivery? That becomes a question. The second part of the question asks about uh, drug concentration estimations on the cancer side. Uh, unfortunately, the only methods that I know of is to you have to get the tumors and then after that, you subject the tumor to HPLC. So in the HPLC's methods, you can actually quantify the, the amounts of the drugs that are in there. For example, in our case, is we estimate the amount of the gemcitabines and also the topotrienol uh, active ingredients in the cancer tumor when you take out the cancer tumors itself. Um, that is actually the best methods to, to do um, to actually confirm the drug concentrations in the tumor site. Um, but in humans, uh, per se, a lot of times it's actually hard to estimate because uh, you, you may not be able to get the tumor most of the time. And when pancreatic cancer per se, a lot of patients are not uh, advisable for, for going for op- operation because the tumor site is actually reside at the behind actually of your, your a lot of the organs like stomachs and the liver. So it's actually very difficult for you to actually reach the pancreatic cancer. That's one. Second is they are very big. So when they are too big, you may not want to excise them. So at the end of the day, the, the question is you we we still not able to actually quantify it very accurately. And uh, when I say to HPLC, it's most of the method that we use in vitro and uh, in animal study. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mai. Uh, mm. And uh, one last question from uh, UD. Okay, mm. uh, dear Dr. Mai, I would like to ask how to target niosome only on cancer cells and what kind of excipient do you use to form the tocopherol niosome system? So to target niosomes, uh, we... We currently do, did not do any specific targeting. So as per says that I didn't tag the niosomes to, to recognize certain, certain things at the surface of the cancer. Uh, of course, this niosome, if you look through the, the structures, they actually have other arms that is available for me to tag on. For example, let's say if I know a particular surface markers interested only on pancreatic cancer, I can tag a, 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 a recognized nicer, like, like a lock and a key, and they, they, they will recognize the tumor cells and then they will go to the tumor cells and then they will release themselves. And unfortunately, in pancreatic cancer, there isn't a very specific tumor uh, marker. So, at, it, which means that even I want to tag them, there is no confirmed biomarkers for us to tag pancreatic cancer for the time being. CA19 is one of those that they say claim to be pancreatic cancer marker, but it is not specific to pancreatic cancer alone. It may bind to other cells. So if we found a specific marker, then we can actually tag them. And what is the excipients that we use in, in these uh, ni- niosomes is actually uh, spam 60 as well as cholesterol. It's actually a very common excipients that you can actually find. I can share with you uh, a little bit on the papers later. I will drop it in the chat group so that you guys can, who is interested in the, the excipients and the technique and the characterizations, you may actually look through a, a bit in the paper. So I hope I answered the three questions. Yeah, uh, yeah. thank you, Dr. Mai. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Changi, you have uh, <laughs> two questions. Uh, okay. uh, one, uh, one, uh, one question with two parts from Gresti. So yeah. uh, this, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the, the person who asked the question earlier on, uh, from your explanation that nanotechnology research findings come from synthetic chemicals, what if they are made of natural materials? How is nanotechnology used in pharmaceutical industry? And... Uh, how long will it, uh, maybe one question first and then after that i'll ask another question okay, okay. thank you so oh it's, thank you very much for christy for the nice uh question so what what if uh they are made from natural made material from, um, yeah is, is it possible because uh you can it is possible but it's need a long research and and i think it's still challenging because uh for example uh you can use the uh, I, I think everyone know here is uh, rice, rice full ox, rice full ox, or we call it apusa kampadi. Yes, yes. apusa kampadi can be uh, used for the source of the TOS, for the source of silica, because it's content of many of silica in the rice uh, full ox. And then our father, we can use also the natural, uh, natural uh, stabilizer, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, natural uh, directing agent, like from the oil and etc. Et 
so that is uh, uh, still possible uh, if if uh, we made the catalyst uh, such uh, such catalyst from the uh, from the nature like that and then how is nanotechnology used in pharmaceutical industry i think uh, a lot of nanotechnology has been applied in the uh, in the uh, pharmaceutical industry in the production of uh, effective drugs and also in the uh, in the like a chemical chemical uh, chemotherapy and then effective uh, MRI, like a uh, bioimaging this mri etc so I, I hope it is uh uh, answer the question. Thank you, Dr. Changi. And uh, yeah. one more last question uh, from Gresti. How long will yeah. it take for this research on nanoparticle to be ready to be applied and utilized? Yeah, currently our research group uh, uh, have, a, have a collaboration with the industry as, as I, as I uh, previously uh, uh, present that uh, the catalyst is uh, quite powerful to reduce uh, the organic contaminant to the to the more effect uh, to the uh, uh, more uh, less toxic uh, chemical like natural any uh, like aminophenol which is a uh, useful uh, intermediate in the in the uh, pharmaceutical industry and we we currently uh, scale up this research to 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 have a larger or a more uh, more uh, integrated or more comprehensive research with the industry. So, uh, if you, how long is it? If if I cannot answer uh, uh, precisely, but we still uh, do uh, for the progress uh, for the scale up to the industry application. Yeah. Okay, I think it's. Uh, I hope it is answer your question. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I was yeah. on mute. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Changi, for the, uh, okay. for the answer. Uh, and uh, yeah. maybe one last question only from uh, uh, UD. Uh, I would like to ask, what is the percentage of efficacy, uh, the percentage efficacy of entrapment of okay. uh, nickel SBA16C for drugs, okay. especially natural drugs? Okay, so uh, we have done from the uh, enzyme uh, immobilization or enzyme entrapment uh, because it has a high surface area and it has a high portfolio that the percentage can be more make it higher and so far we can we can uh, uh, up to 50 percent to 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 uh, entrap the bioactive material but for the drugs uh, we have done it we have done it before so uh, I think we need to study about oh, about the chemical about chemical structure of the drugs and how its interaction to the uh, uh, pore to the uh, Mesopore sub sub, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Changi, and thank you so much, Dr. Mai. Uh, unfortunately, we ran out of time, and uh, uh, we would like to pass it over to the MC to close this session. Uh, thank you very much for attending from uh, uh, China and Taiwan. It's very, very interesting. <laughs> thank you very much. Let me see, over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Apotheker Kevin Ben Lawrence, RPH, for moderating the first panel discussion and for all the speakers. Now we would like to ask all of you to stay because we would like to present certificates in this session. And to present the certificate, kindly we're inviting the seminar chairman, Apotheker Dr. Randes Kosasi, Master of Science. And for the committee chairman, Dr. Chun Wai Mai, CSCSI, PhD, and Mr. Changi, Setia Budi, PhD, as the speakers, and Apotheker Kevin Ben Lawrence, RPH, as moderator, we welcome you to come up to the screen to receive the certificates and get ready for the photo session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our committee will take a picture in three, two, one. Okay, once more, thank you for the committee chairman and our moderator.
Excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen, we are now continuing our meeting to the next agenda, which is likely to hear the plenary lectures, which will be delivered by Professor Dr. Apoteker Heni Rahmawati, Magister Science from Sekolah Farmasi Institut Teknologi Bandung, Professor Dr. Apoteker Evionora Anwar, Magister Science from Universitas Pancasila, and keynote speech, which will be delivered by Dr. Goh Chun Fugo, BFARM PhD RPH from University Science Malaysia Penang, who will be delivered moderated by apoteker Hesti Utami Ramadaniati, Master in Clinical Pharmacy, PhD. And first of all, allow me to introduce our moderator, Sisi. Hesti Utami Ramadaniati, Master in Clinical Pharmacy, PhD, is born in Palembang, 16 July, 1982. And for academic qualification, graduated from Bachelor of Pharmacy in Gajah Mada University in 2004, graduated as Pharmacist, Faculty of Pharmacy, Gajah Mada University in 2005, Graduated from Master of Clinical Pharmacy Program, the University of Queensland, Australia in 2007. Graduated from Doctoral Program, School of Pharmacy, Perthian University, Australia in 2015. Scholarship, travel grant, and other achievement. Research grant from National Institute of Health Research, United Kingdom in 2020 until 2023. Research grant from Ministry of Education Postgraduate Research Scheme in 2020. The best oral presenter at the third postgraduate seminar in pharmaceutical science in 2020. And still a lot of scholarship, travel grant, and other achievements that she got. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Apoteker Hesti Utami Ramadaniati, Master in Clinical Pharmacy, PhD. The time is yours. Okay, thank you MC for the nice introduction. Good day everyone. Welcome back to the second session of the fifth International Conference on Pharmaceutical Nanotechnology, Application of Nanotechnology in Drugs, Cosmetic and Herbal Medicine Industry. I believe that all participants are still having so much energy to join the second session. You know what? I guarantee this session will be insightful and will broaden our knowledge as we will upgrade the recent knowledge about nanotechnology from the expert. Okay, today we are so fortunate as we have three experienced speakers, Prof. Hani Rahmawati from Bandung Institute of Technology, Prof. Evionor Anwar from Universitas Pancasila, and Dr. Go Chon Fu from University of Malaysia. Dr. Go Chon Fu, I do apologize if I do not pronounce your name correctly. Each speaker will be given approximately 30 minutes to deliver the talk, and at the end, we will have panel discussion with the speakers. Okay. Without further ado, I would like to invite Prof. Hani Rahmawati to give her talk on strategy for nanotechnology-based product development containing oily bioactive compound. Prof. Hani is a lecturer from School of Pharmacy, Bandung Institute of Technology, ITB. She's also the head of doctoral program and the head of research center for nanoscience and nanotechnology in her home institute. Prof. Hani did her bachelor and master degree from School of Pharmacy from ITB, then she continued her doctoral degree in University of Groningen, the Netherlands, and some postdoctoral placement in Germany and Singapore. She has published more than 90%, that is so amazing, and some books, and she's also holding eight patents and many other academic achievements. Prof. Hani, you have 30 minutes to present, and now the time is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Hesti. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, organizing committee for inviting me to share uh, a little bit what I'm doing in uh, our institution at this morning. So uh, let me share my presentation. Okay, so. Is it a uh, sin? Yes, you have seen your. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, as uh, mentioned by moderator, uh, my topic will be uh, the strategy yeah, for nanotechnology-based product development containing oil, oily bioactive compound. So actually, uh, my focus, uh, my my interest, my research interest is about uh, plant-based uh, pharmaceutical products. So I'm very interested uh, to use uh, nanotechnology as a, a tool yeah, to formulate a plant-based uh, bioactive compound because uh, in Indonesia, we know that uh, Indonesia is rich with um, a medicinal plants. So, so that's why um, my research will be uh, focusing on this uh, uh, bioactive material. And in, uh, in this session, uh, I would like to uh, focus only on uh, essential oil, so plant uh, essential oil, and why uh, this compound is uh, very interesting for my research because uh, as we know that essential oil at the moment gaining a lot of interest. And uh, my talk will be focusing more on a practical approach, yeah, how to uh, formulate uh, essential oil from plant and to get a, a improvement in a pharmaceutical aspect. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, essential oil uh, at the moment gaining a lot of interest from many uh, pharmaceutical company. And if we see here, the market of essential uh, oil in, in, in global market uh, increasing by, by years. So in 2026, uh, we see uh, improving yeah, in amount of essential oil use for medical application. This, this is a, a report yeah, in North American uh, essential oil market, but also uh, in Indonesia. Yeah. In global market, uh, a lot of uh, uh, countries yeah, uh, uh, focusing on this uh, material for many purposes. As we see here, uh, industry flavor and fragrance in Indonesia, we see 10 uh, top 10 uh, um, uh, industry, yeah, as you see in, in this uh, cycle. Um, for uh, among these 10 uh, top uh, industry are already in Indonesia and they are focusing on uh, essential oil pro production yeah, to support the need uh, in Indonesian uh, market, yeah, not only in pharmaceutical uh, use, but also in other fields. Uh, why essential oil getting so much interest for many other uh, uh, countries? Yeah, as we see that um, there are many activities, especially for medical application. So essential oil as a aromatic plant extract, and the main activity, uh, I think, or uh, everybody knows, yeah, as an antioxidant, as an antimicrobe, and also as an insecticide. And they are used for food uh, industry, for cosmetic industry, and also for pharmaceutical industry. And uh, yeah, this is not our uh, uh, part, but uh, essential oils also used in feed additive, yeah, for growing the uh, the like a poultry, some something like that. And especially in medical application, so we see that. Uh, the use of essential oil, especially yeah, uh, for aromatically, uh, for uh, internal internal use, and for topical use. For aromatical use, um, for example, yeah, to affect the mood and the memory and airways, yeah, airways uh, health, and this can be uh, used as a diffusion or as uh, inhalation uh, product. And inter in internal use uh, can be drink or uh, directly use yeah, for a digestive, digestive system to improve the health of mouth, throat, or other organs yeah, along the uh, digestive uh, system. And also in, in topical use, uh, normally used for like uh, immediate uh, release, uh, immediate uh, therapeutic use and for systemic uh, and also localized effect. 
even uh, yeah uh, targeting for all uh, age yeah from infant to the elderly people so this is really uh, interesting um, bioactive material yeah and of course um, we we have to improve how to formulate to get uh, the optimum uh, applic uh, effect so the these are different uh, application for uh, essential oil as uh, mentioned in the previous slide that for uh, inhalation and diff diffusion topical and also combination of uh, three of both of them so for example in, in inhalation so the essential oil uh, directly inhaled yeah from petal so meaning a pure essential oil without any formulation and can be also form, form, formulate yeah formulate for uh, improving the effect of this essential oil of course uh, we, there are many uh, consideration um, how to get good formulation for this uh, bioactive compound because we know that essential oil is different with other bioactive compound so in physics uh, essential oils is uh, liquid yeah and as we know here so essential oil actually derived from uh, various uh, plants it, um, growing in, in Indonesia. So uh, we see from citron and other uh, uh, plant uh, as uh, mentioned in this slide. And as we uh, know that the function of this essential oil, as I mentioned before, not only for antioxidant, anti uh, uh, microbe and also insect, this, uh, insect decidal activity, but also other like anti-inflammation, even anti-cancer and antibacterial, anti-fungi. Yeah, so many activities um, covered by this essential oils. So this really, uh, uh, what to say, uh, incredible yeah, bioactive compound. And of course, uh, a lot of um, attention, yeah, how to improve the use of this uh, bioactive compound. And uh, in relation to the formulation strategy, of course, uh, first we have to know the characteristic of this essential oil. So different sources, different characteristics. So here uh, we see a table uh, mentioning the different uh, physical uh, uh, properties of the essential oil. For example, uh, lino, sorry, I have this too small. Uh, <clears throat> Linal oil, yeah, uh, essential oil or uh, acyclic uh, monoterpene with the molecular weights and the organoleptic description, flash point density, uh, etc. Et so this actually uh, parameter used uh, for developing the good product, but um, focusing on solubility and stability, yeah, the the two uh, main parameter are important and crucial, yeah, especially for uh, choosing the right dosage uh, uh, form and the right technique uh, in the process of formulation. So as, as uh, we, see, we see here, the solubility, for example, so this is important. Yeah, uh, some, even uh, most of essential oil are water insoluble, yeah, they are, mostly uh, organic, yeah, in organic uh, solvent, uh, dissolve in organic solvent. So in soluble, in, in alcohol, ether, fixed oil, propylene glycol, yeah, and uh, other uh, solvent as, as uh, mentioned here, yeah. And uh, another parameter, yeah, the important parameter for uh, formulation development uh, is uh, stability. So we have to really concern uh, whether thermal st stable or instable, uh, what is high, uh, hydrolytic uh, 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 degradation or uh, ox oxidized by oxygen and catalyzed by uh, oxygen for the oxidation degradation by light, et etc. Yeah. So here. Um, a lot of uh, example of essential oil, yeah, especially use uh, every day, yeah, like menta pip, yeah, cinnamon, yeah, essential oil from cinnamon park, 
uh, essential oil from thyme and essential oil for from uh, cumin and from nutmeg and other uh, medicinal plant. And we see uh, the different solubility and how um, respond to the atmosphere. Yeah, for example, uh, essential oil from cinnamon bark. Uh, it is uh, darkened, yeah, and thickened on exposure to the air, yeah. And for example, essential oil from from cumin, yeah, tend to darken on aging, yeah, in the storage for uh, uh, this, yeah, not stable in in storage condition, quite sensitive to daylight, yeah, to the air, to the moisture and the metal, yeah, to catalyze uh, the oxidation reaction as well as uh, sensitive to alkali. alkali. So this information, of course, um, uh, guiding us yeah, when we uh, uh, have to choose the right uh, process form yeah, and the right product and uh, how to pro pro process yeah, during the formulation. So the stabili stability aspect uh, is very, very important. Yeah. Uh, to guide us uh, to choose the right formulation. So for example, here, a uh, different kind of uh, structure, yeah, representative uh, structure, typical for essential oil. Yeah, so like uh, short chains, aliphatic, yeah, here, uh, three octane, octanon, uh, terpenoid or isoprenoid, yeah, like beta caryopylene, camphor, thymol, yeah, eugenol, limonen, citral, and cineol. So I think uh, we are familiar with this kind of uh, uh, essential oil, yeah, with this kind of uh, chemical structure of the essential oil, because this, uh, uh, yeah, in daily use, in daily uh, activity, we, we, we normally use this kind of uh, essential oil, yeah, for, for, um, keeping the health condition. Okay, so um, uh, here telling about the degradation pathway of the essential oil. So as mentioned before, that a lot of uh, uh, atmosphere uh, parameter uh, influence the stability of the essential oil. So like heat, yeah, light and air. So can change the component of essential oil, yeah, uh, for uh, undergoing the isomerization reaction, for example, oxidation, dehydrogenation, yeah, polymerization, and also thermal rearrangement. So this kind of chemical reaction normally uh, happen on the essential oil when exposed exposed to the heat, light, or or air or, or oxygen. So. Um, this is example for the oxidative reaction of the terpenoid, yeah, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, chemical uh, family yeah, for the essential oil. So from uh, one uh, structure to other structure because of uh, parameter as mentioned before, the oxy oxygen or because of the hydrolysis, hydrolysis yeah, changing to uh, other components which are maybe not active as compared to the, the the initial uh, structure, yeah, this de 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 dehydrogenation, yeah, and possible hydrogen rearrangement, yeah, for example, this uh, A pathway, yeah, because of de de dehydrogenation and possible uh, hydro hydrogen rearrangement. So the, the position of hydrogen change from one position to the other position. And, and, and if, if we see in the B pathway, so uh, auto oxidation pathway, yeah, oxidation uh, uh, by itself, yeah, auto oxidation leading to the hydroperoxide, yeah, and subsequent degradation, yeah. So, so the oxidation uh, followed by uh, uh, hydroperoxidation into the secondary oxidation uh, product, and of course, this uh, uh, gain more uh, con uh, attention, yeah, during the formulation process. And this uh, example for isomerization yeah, and oxidation product yeah, of trans uh, anethol yeah, detected in phenyl, phenyl oil. Yeah, phenyl oil is kind of uh, essential oil. 
So this is just a short summary for the uh, determinant yeah, of essential oil stability. Yeah, I think other other bioactive compound also um, influenced by this parameter. Yeah, not only for essential oil, but but also other chemical uh, uh, drug. Yeah, uh, they are degraded by high temperature. Yeah, by light exposure, by oxygen. Uh, heavy metal, heavy metal for uh, catalytic reaction, yeah, for oxidation, also for moisture, yeah, to uh, facilitate the hydrolytic uh, reaction. Okay, so uh, here we come to the the technical uh, uh, aspect, yeah, step by step to to the formulation, yeah, for essential oil. Of course, this also uh, not only for essential actually, but also for other uh, drug. Yeah. So of course, first uh, selection yeah, of the essential oil. So which essential oil uh, will be uh, formulated, and how the characteristic, yeah, physical chemical character characterization, and um, the stability, uh, of course. And after that, uh, the selection of carrier. Yeah. So then we will go to the nano carrier system. Yeah, so uh, in in the phase of selection of essential oil, of course, we need information about the physical chemical properties, about the bioavailability, the bioactivity, etc. And also in the selection of carrier, we need uh, the information about the physical chemical properties and biodegradability. Yeah, uh, how the carrier can support the stability of the bioactive compound. And during the selection of career, we should uh, consider, yeah. So actually my focus at the moment, my research focus at the moment is utilize the uh, bioproduct, yeah. So meaning um, organic waste, yeah. So why I use organic waste? Because I think not many people uh, aware with the organic waste. So I uh, really consider organic waste because behind the organic waste, there are still many other uh, uh, good components that can be used for not only a uh, bioactive compound, but also excipient yeah, to support the pharmaceutical uh, formulation. So that's why uh, uh, in this uh, moment, I would like to highlight the use of uh, bio uh, product, yeah? so the waste from agriculture or from uh, food production. Okay, then after that, of course, the other uh, aspect should be considered during formulation is how to formulate, yeah? meaning what the method yeah, to uh, formulate the bioactive compound yeah, in the carrier system. Yeah, so what technique? Uh, so in this case, uh, uh, I use uh, encapsulation technique, yeah, nano-encapsulation technique because we are talking about the nanotechnology to support um, the, the formulation of uh, essential oil. Okay, here's some uh, technique, yeah, some encapsulation technique for uh, essential oil. We can use extrusion, we can use spray drying, we can use freeze drying, co-extraction. Co co so I just want to uh, describe shortly uh, for its technique. Yeah, first, uh, first is uh, emulsification. Yeah. So actually, emulsification is in in the uh, conservation technique. Yeah. So emulsification, of course, in the the most simple, the, the simplest method. Yeah, to encapsulate uh, the 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 liquid. Yeah, the liquid uh, bioactive. Uh, the liquid. A drug, yeah, for uh, including essential oil. So can be uh, with low energy input or high energy input. But in my case, I prefer to use low energy input mm -hmm. or spontaneous uh, method. So a lot of research uh, done by my students. So mostly use a uh, low energy input or spontaneous uh, emulsification. Especially uh, in the lab, who yeah, where no uh, sophisticated uh, facility yeah, to support the product development. So I suggest to use the simplest uh, method, but 
um, efektif ya. The simples not mean uh, bad ya. Yeah. So simples uh, even sometimes uh, the best method ya yeah, to get the good product ya yeah, with uh, efficient ya yeah, cost effective and uh, scalable ya yeah, in in pharma in, in industrial scale. But of course in term of scientific ya yeah, scientific aspect maybe in the simplest one um, with uh, not have a high uh, impact yeah, for publication but for uh, commercialization uh, as uh, the simple the simplest the better yeah because the simple the the, the more cost effective so this is what i use uh, at the moment in in our lab yeah in in the in in pharmacy in in, in itb So of course, uh, in emulsification, we use two different uh, phases, yeah, or uh, aqueous phase and uh, oil phase. So in in oil phase, uh, even uh, essential oil can be used uh, not only as bioactive compound but also as a uh, oil, yeah, uh, carry oil. Normally, we use oil, yeah, for example, paraf paraffin oil, yeah, paraffin liquid, yeah, or um, the pharmaceutical oil yeah uh, excipient yeah uh, the pharma, uh, pharmaceutical excipient uh, oil yeah but um, in case of essential oil we can also use oil as a carrier or uh, emus for 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 itself yeah so then the components only uh, aqueous phase and essential oil and of course the emulsifier and go uh, surfactant yeah to have a uh, nano emulsion yeah to have good nano emulsion. And the second method is uh, conservation. Yeah, so this is simple, yeah. So only uh, adding the polar phase uh, in a polymer solution, yeah. And then we can use uh, alcohol and gelatin solution, yeah, to form the uh, matrix. Yeah, and the simple one. It co also can be in the complex one. So for the complex yeah, the complex one we disperse yeah and stir to polymer solution so we use more than one polymer and then terminate by uh, uh, reticulation yeah with an agent of essential oil so we can use like uh, gelatin arabica yeah so the normal excipient yeah used for pharmaceutical formulation and the third one uh, this is more technology yeah we use uh, technology and yeah, we use uh, um, uh yeah like more complicated uh, facility like a spray dryer yeah so spray drying method uh, can be also to form uh, emulsion yeah? so first we we emulsify the the liquid yeah the mixture between the aqueous form and the the liquid and the the oil uh, form and then we emulsify it and then uh, we change from the liquid to the solid by uh, spray drying Yeah, of course, in this uh, in this method, yeah, the component, um, yeah, what to say? We use a high high temperature, yeah, to change, yeah, to change from the liquid to the the solid, yeah. So we should uh, consider about the thermal stability of the uh, bioactive component. And the fourth one, complexation, yeah. So we can use uh, freeze drying, yeah, yeah. So this is also high uh, facility, yeah. So need a uh, Yeah, I mean high cost. Yeah, spray drying or freeze drying is a high cost. So we should consider about the 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 big scale. Yeah, when we produce a big scale product. In this case, we can use beta cyclodextrin dendrimer. Yeah, so the dendrimer is the advanced material. Yeah, but this beta cyclodextrin, the normal material, can be also used to form and the 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 uh, and nano encapsulation of the essential oil and other uh, method uh, i think this is uh, normal yeah so common method so done by many investigator like ionic gelation yeah so the ionic gelation actually just a uh, uh, concept of using a polysaccharide yeah and then a cross link with a cross linking agent so for example here we can use um, alkinate yeah, kytosan kytosan So the normal uh, polysaccharide used for uh, nano carrier, and we can use cross linker like calcium chloride, yeah, uh, pantasodium tripolyphosphate, yeah, TPP, and also it's SMP, yeah, to cross link the the polysaccharide. 
Nano precipitation also simple method. Yeah, we can use uh, ketosan yeah, as a matrix. And in this case, what the difference between ionic chelation and the nano precipitation? So we don't use a cross linker, cross linker in, in this nano precipitation. So we only use uh, anti sulfon Yeah, anti uh, when the ketosan is uh, dissolved in water yeah, or in uh, certain pH yeah, to dissolve a ketosan and then add the anti sulfon yeah, to, to change uh, from the liquid the sol solution to the uh, solid particle. Oh, Penny, sorry, you, you have less than five minutes to go. Okay. Yeah, and other uh, method, yeah, as you see here, yeah, film hydra hydration method. So use for um, liposome, so we use liquid, for example. And we can also use uh, active film. Yeah, so using again uh, alginate and calcium carbonate and sorbitol to form the matrix for a uh, carrier, yeah, for the nano carrier. So actually, uh, there are a lot of uh, methods yeah, to encapsulate the uh, essential oil. So here, uh, actually, I just pop up yeah, three different uh, polysaccharides yeah, as a good candidate yeah, to encapsulate the essential oil in order to facilitate a control release. Yeah. In case we need control release, yeah, for certain uh, therapy, we need control release yeah, to get a prolonged action. So we can use this uh, three different uh, polysaccharides as a carrier to encapsulate the uh, bioactive uh, from the essential oil. Essential oil or bioactive uh, contain in for, for uh, essential oils. So for alginate, we can use like multiple emulsion, yeah, ionic gelation, active film, spray drying as mentioned before. And for kytosan, uh, similar, yeah, but here we can also uh, use nanogel mediated yeah, uh, nano encapsulation. And this is the simple one, yes, cyclodextrin. Yeah, we can use a complex uh, inclusion yeah, by kneading, yeah, this physical process, freeze drying, yeah, and also in, in solution. So yeah, three three good candidates, yeah, polysaccharide for uh, control release of essential oil. So uh, at the moment, essential because as I mentioned before, essential oils get, get gaining a lot of interest yeah, for many applications. So not only just a simple formulation yeah, like immediate release, but also advanced formulation to target essential oil for certain uh, organ, as mentioned by in the first uh, keynote speaker. Yeah. And also to modify the release of essential oil to get prolonged action yeah, in the body or uh, topical, for example, on the surface of uh, uh, skin, for example. Yeah. So uh, modern formulation can be also applied for essential oil. Yeah. Okay, so these are, are the form, yeah, for the whole look like of the nano carrier, uh, we can encapsulate the essential oil. So this is more complex uh, form, form, yeah, like polysaccharide carrier, and there are two, yeah, like here polysaccharide hydrogel, yeah, uh, embedded in the uh, nano carrier. And uh, for the uh, hydrogel, you can see here the structure of hydrogel, uh, in, in between the uh, polymer uh, chains, yeah, the essential oil, oils are located here. And we can see from, from the, the benefit of this method, yeah, uh, how about the loading capacity, how about the encapsulation efficiency, and how about the mechanical and thermal stability. So we can compare yeah, three different uh, form, yeah, nanocarrier form. In case of, uh, in terms of the mechanical and thermal stability, the loading capacity, and uh, encapsulation efficiency. Of course, formulator, formulator always need, yeah, always uh, want to have um, low mechanical and thermal, high, yeah, high mechanical and thermal stability, high loading capacity, high encapsulation efficiency. But uh, this is uh, the most ideal, yeah, the most ideal uh, 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 result, yeah. I think not all, yeah, I think a non, uh, non carrier system can show uh, the ideal uh, parameter, yeah. So either high mechanical thermal stability, but low loading capacity and high encapsulation efficiency, yeah. Or a low, yeah, low mechanical and thermal stability, but high loading capacity, high encapsulation. So which, actually which one we, we focus, yeah when we choose the, the, the nanocardial system. 
Okay, as I mentioned before, that I really interested uh, using agro-wis, yeah? uh, either food waste or agriculture residue, agricultural residue. Yeah, so actually, yeah, alkinet is a waste, actually, waste from the agro-wis. Yeah. Uh, uh, maltodextrin also, cellulose also. So this is byproduct yeah, from other uh, more uh, important uh, component. Yeah. So alkinet actually, Product. So we can. So why I interested in this because yeah uh, the the uh, superiority yeah of this uh, material to support the formulation on the essential oil or compound of essential oil. Okay. So from this uh, uh, many uh, polysaccharide yeah protein yeah or or lipid yeah and vegetable oil we can uh, get different form of nanocarrier system yeah like hydrogel bead monolayer capsule yeah. Multi-layer capsule, uh, composite air yeah, bit, and then uh, liposome. And we can use not only for oral application, but uh, can be for dermal or uh, and other application. Yeah. And we have, of course, to consider about the bioavailability and the bioaccessibility, target delivery, bioactive. So uh, actually, as mentioned by first uh, keynote speaker, we can functionalize yeah, the surface of this nanocarrier system using a specific lichen yeah, for uh, active targeting, or we can modify the particle size of this uh, parent system to get passive targeting. So uh, from the conventional nanocar system, we can uh, go to the ADVAN yeah, nanocar system. Mm -hmm. So what ADVAN nanocar system is yeah, uh, function improving the, the, the function of the surface uh, of the particle. Yeah, by adding different molecule, yeah, which uh, has a, a function to go to the specific receptor, for example, or specific uh, by uh, endogenous uh, bio biomolecule uh, expressed on the surface of cell. So the concept of uh, nanocarrier uh, or nanoparticle uh, targeting, yeah, for active targeting or for uh, passive targeting. Okay, so actually this is the common uh, benefit of uh, encapsulation. Yeah, not only for essential oil, but, but also other other drug, yeah, other active compound. Yeah, to provide stability, of course, yeah, to prevent degradation, increase uh, bioefficacy, yeah, increase absorption in the body, enhance uh, the efficacy, yeah, set specific delivery. So this is uh, what uh, uh, everybody know interested uh, to this uh, topic, yeah, uh, set specific delivery. And also the need of medicinal uh, application, yeah, uh, at the moment because uh, a lot of side effect may be um, making patient uh, unconvenient, yeah, to get therapy. So the trend at the moment is uh, how to target, yeah, the drug to the specific uh, organ or specific tissue or even specific cell. And the other benefit is convert the liquid to powder, yeah. So we even we can prolong the use of essential oil because essential oil is a volatile, yeah. Uh, and this volatile making a short effect, yeah, short uh, function, yeah. For example, for fragrance, short uh, frag fragrancy, yeah. So we can prolong the the function of the essential oil as a fragrance, for example, yeah, by converting this uh, liquid form to the powder uh, form, yeah. Of course, using specific technique, yeah, like uh, uh, we talk by uh, second keynote speaker using mesoporous uh, silica, for example, yeah, to uh, accommodate uh, essential oil in, in the pore, yeah, in the nanopore, so that this uh, essential oil can function uh, longer than uh, in the pure uh, pore. Yeah. And easy of processing, of course. Prof. Penny, sorry, maybe you can jump to the conclusions. Okay, okay so yeah. Yeah, so this is my own uh, project. Yeah, my uh, ongoing project yeah, done by uh, PhD student, my PhD student uh, related to the nanoform based plant oil. So we are not developing nano emulsion of moringa oil for liver cancer therapy, and olive oil nano emulsion for cosmetic. Yeah, especially this is not only cosmetic but cosmetical maybe. Yeah. And the nanocarrier system of avocado oil for anti-aging. So anti-aging is not only uh, to improve the beauty and yeah, the the skin uh, health, yeah, but also 
uh, uh, to prevent the, the degenerative uh, diseases yeah, as an indicator for aging. Yeah. So uh, this good uh, oil yeah, from avocado, uh, it can also, uh, not only improve the uh, skin performance, but also uh, delaying the degenerative uh, diseases. Okay, this conclusion, yeah, various factors influencing a uh, essential oil formulation. So of course the physical, uh, physical chemical properties, the stability, the target user or application, yeah, can be for drug, cosmetic or food, and also in the dosage form, yeah, either in the spray form, in inhalation, in ingestion, or in solid and other uh, dosage form. So thank you very much for your attention, and I give back the time to the moderator. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Henny, for sharing a very mind-opening uh, update on essential oil then, and then the strategy to formulate the essential oil. Okay, now we move to the second uh, speaker for this uh, session. Okay, our second speaker is Prof. Evionora Anwar from Universitas Pancasila. I normally call her Prof. Evi. So Prof. Evi is a lecturer from Universitas Pancasila. She did her Bachelor of Pharmacy in um, University of Indonesia. Okay, or maybe, okay. Okay, this is the picture of Prof. Evi. Okay, she, uh, she did her Bachelor of Pharmacy in University of Indonesia, and then she pursued her postgraduate education in Bogor Institute of Agriculture. Well, to be honest, I'm a bit overwhelmed and amazed to read through her CV as Prof. Evi has approximately uh, more than 100 published papers and many research run. So this time, Prof. Evi will give her talk on application of liquid nanocarrier technology for improving penetration of natural active ingredients in the skincare cosmetics product. Okay, uh, Prof. Epi, you're still here now? Okay. Prof. Epi, you have uh, 30 minutes to present and now the time is yours. Thank you very much, Bu uh, Hesti. And ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My, my speaker is quite different with the previous speaker, which more scientific. I want to talk about skincare cosmetic product that improve our appearance and beautiful and attractive. But the title of our speaker is Application of a Lipid Nanocarrier Technology for Improving Penetration of Natural Active Ingredients in the Skin in the Skin Care Cosmetic Product. Why people need a skincare cosmetic product? Because they want to look beautiful and attractive. What is a beautiful? Because beautiful appearance will last a few decades, but a beautiful personality will last a lifetime. Beauty comes in different form for every woman natural, wonderful, and healthy. We all have different tastes, and this affects our definition and perception of beauty with regard to the every woman in the world. If someone cannot agree on what is defined beauty, because each of us perceives beauty differently, how can a woman discover her desired beauty? Personal appearance, including your beauty, can be obtained by maintaining healthy skin using skin, skin, a skin care cosmetic. 
last few years, everyone wants to look interest. They are willing to go far away from home to improve their appearance. In the market skincare cosmetic products, abundant available with various brands for the beauty creation of the human body. Cosmetically active ingredients are constantly being developed by big and small corporations engaged especially in natural ingredient skincare cosmetics products. While advanced in the field formulation technology and knowledge of skin biology and pharmacology have facilitated the cosmetic industry's development in lipid nanocarrier technology. Desirable features of cosmetical agents are efficacy, safety, formulation stability, novelty, and patent protection, metabolism within skin and in expensive manufacture process. To maintain healthy skin, it is necessary to pay attention to focus that can damage the skin. UVA, UVA rays penetrate deep into the skin, then UVB rays. Exposure to UVA rays more than 15 minutes can cause skin damaging, cause skin uh, darkening and somber. The effect of UVA rays tend to appear more quickly after exposure. USB rays damage the outermost layer of the skin, just like UVA. UVB can also make the skin look darker and somber. Short-term exposure of UVB rays can cause the skin to turn red. Usually, the effect of UVB appears several hours after sun exposure because UVC doesn't reach the atmosphere, it cannot have any effect on the skin. What is factor causing skin damage? In addition to aging, environmental factor affect skin changes, especially their impact on the natural process of the skin. The health skin expert also said that sunlight is the main cause the skin damage because the content of ultraviolet rays and of the radicals. In chemistry, radical is an atom, molecule, or ion that has at least one unpaired valence electron. The unpaired electrons make radicals highly chemically reactive that can cause skin aging and damage. The respiratory exposure UV radiation to the skin cause accelerated physical changes in the skin and connective tissue through the formulation of lipid peroxide, the cell content and reactive oxygen species arose. In it leads to loss of skin elasticity implicated in formation of a wrinkle and even pigmentation bronze spot. During aging process, collagen, elastin, and tyrosine degrees that cause lose the strength and flexibility of the skin, resulting in visible wrinkles and bronze spot. It is also related to increasing enzyme activity, including collagenous, elastis, and tyrosinase. Collagenase is known as an enzyme that plays a role in the degradation of collagens. Meanwhile, elastin plays a role in the maintenance of skin elasticity and tyrosins inhibited skin pigmentation. Oxidation stress can be harmful 
to human, including healthy skin. Healthy skin has the capacity to balance peroxidation, but in adverse situations, such as under pollution and UV radiation, it can be unbalanced. Antioxidants are great components to facilitate the return to free radicals to state or of balance. Next. Antioxidants have been used in topical products for different purposes, but the main function is to create better condition for healthy skin. Nature provided an abundant source of antioxidant substances and nature phenolic compounds we demonstrate the topical photo protective action as well as antioxidant potential anti-aging anti-pollutants which is beneficial to the skin care traditional antioxidant substances have been evaluated to skin protection the sub Patient of erythema induced by UV radiation has been an important parameter for evaluating the action of this antioxidant. The four months for antioxidant for skincare cosmetic product, many skincare products incorporate antioxidant into their formulation to provide immediate benefits to the skin. How effective antioxidants are right topical is still being researched. More in-depth research on the effect of antioxidant is in skincare is still being carried out. Example of natural antioxidants used in cosmetic preparation that can increase penetration. One of them is green tea camellia synthesis and extract of apple or mollus domestica meals. Both of them contain high activity of antioxidants. Increased penetration of natural active substance using lipid nanocarrier technology. Currently, to improve the quality of these cosmetics, natural ingredients are used, which are formulated using a lipid nanocarrier technology. Most of the biological active constituents of plants are polar or water soluble molecules like flavonoids and phenolics and and etc the demand of natural skin care product is steadily growing since consumers perceive them as safe and they use to prevent or treat skin aging most antioxidant present use in that skin care formulation one of the other hand the antioxidant so unfor unfavorable physicochemical properties such as excessive lipophilic or hydrophilicity, chemical instability, and poor skin penetration that activity limit their effective their effectiveness when used as a topical application. Therefore, nanophysical is important uh, to make for uh, skin uh, problem. Next. However, water-soluble phytoconstituents like flavonoid, tannin, terpenoid, phenolics, gly glycoside, etc. are poorly absorbed when taken orally or topically. Either to their large molecular size which cannot absorb by passive diffusion or due to their poor lipid solubility. Next. There are three main reach, uh, by which a nanocarrier can promote 
percutaneous absorption composed into the skin, one intracellular roots, two intercellular and three appendical roots. Next. Nanocarrier is divided into several forms, etosome, nanostructure, and extra and etc. Next. Phytosome. Phytosome is a complex of the nature active ingredient and phospholipid. It is claimed that phytosome increased absorption or conventional hep extract and has of solubility and protect from toxicity. The product of nanoparticulate can be formulated in skincare cosmetic product. Next. Nanoparticle products are generally not durable when it's safe, so they must be formulated in certain cosmetic dosage form, such, such as an example cream, serum, ointment, and gel, etc. Next. Uh, this is uh, one of the formulation uh, cream phytoextasome extract green tea. You can see in the picture when before you use the uh, cream and after use the cream. Next. Next. Now, another uh, formula of the uh, nanocarrier is in the gel phytosome extract green tea. And the penetration both of the uh, dosage form can use cell diffusive fronts. Next. What is a liposome? Liposome are closed nanocarrier structures formed by bilayer or hydrated phospholipid. The bilayers are separated from one another by aqueous medium and enclosed and aqueous core. As a consequence of this alternating hydrophilic and hydrophobic structure, liposome have the capacity of entrap compound of different solubilities. Next. Another uh, nanocarrier is itosome, a lipid vesicle containing phospholipid ethanol or isopropyl alcohol in a retired fully light concentration and water. It also are soft vesicle made of phospholipid and ethanol. It also can interrupt drug molecule with various physicochemical characteristics, hydrophilic, lipophilic, and amphiphilic. Next. And another is a trans -etotome. Are composed of phospholipid, lipid, ethanol, water, and its activator, or sulfartan, or permission enhancer. The elasticity of trans itosome is much higher than transfersome and itosome. Moreover, the trans itosome enhances both in vitro and in vivo skin deposition of pharmaceutical ingredient in the dermis or epidermis region compared to transfersome and itosome. There are, based on the current study, the novel carry transfersome could serve an uh, effective dermal delivery for drug. Next. Transfersome are essentially ultra deformable liposome like tranitosome, composed of phospholipid and additional active amphiphilic such as bile such that enable extreme distortion of the physical shape. Next. This is the my uh, or our uh, research. Transfer some gel containing green tea leaf extract, increasing in vitro penetration. 
Next. Uh, this is the uh, figure of the formability of ultra formable vesicle in skin pore. Well, okay. Solid. Uh, another uh, nanocarrier is a solid lipid nanoparticle. Solid lipid nanoparticle are particular structurally related to the polymeric nanoparticle. However, in contrast to polymeric system, SLN can compose of biocompatible lipids and are physiologically well tolerated when administered in FIFO and may also be prepared without organic solvent. The lipid matrix are decomposed of hot, of heads, or wax provide proto protection to the incorporated bioactive from chemical and physical degradation in addition to modification of drug release profile. Typical formulation utilize lipid such as paraffin, wax, or biodegradable glycerides as the structure base of the particle. Next. Uh, this is my uh, research. Uh, the, the title is Formulation Characterization and In Vitro Skin Penetration of Green Tea. Conclusion is a vitro skin penetration study showed that solid lipid nanoparticle SLN improved the penetration of epigallocatechin gallop through the stratum corneum. Next. Nanostructure lipid carrier. Nano lipid carrier is used as carrier for the cosmetic active ingredients, especially in the form Mulation of cosmetic skincare product, NLC also appears in the number of beauty cosmetic products around the world. Next. This is the difference of SLN and NLC. Next. Next. This is my uh, research in vitro analysis of the effects of nanostructure lipid carrier best gel of mulberry root extract again ultraviolet light. And the conclusion is the increase in the percutaneous penetration profile of the NLC gel has positive correlation to the decrease in the skin melanin index compared to the extract gel preparation. Next. Next. Application of lipid nanocarrier technology can improve penetration of natural active ingredients through the skin for beauty and skin care cosmetics, including skin moisturizing, whitening and plaque removing, and anti-aging and sunscreen efficacy, etc. Next. Some sample application of natural active ingredients Nanocarrier skin care cosmetic product. One is a uh, whitening and black speckle removing. Next. Next. Advantage of the nano or lipid carrier for uh, transdermal dosage form. Nanocarrier technology has been effective applied to the development of the biological active constituent of plants delivery system to overcome the limitation of traditional preparation. Next. Next. Conclusion. The application of nanocarrier technology is in cosmetic formulation not only enhances the penetration, stability, and solubility of natural active ingredients, but also overcomes the barrier effects of the cuticle, allowing cosmetic active ingredients to enter the target skin 
sit and realize that their function is carrier or active substance. The nano, the nano carrier is not a final cosmetic dosage form, but also need to be part of the process into suitable cosmetic preparation such as cream, emulsion, gel, and etc. Using of natural antioxidants in cosmetic products is currently increasing. This is probably because synthetic compounds often cause skin problems. While the extract of these natural ingredients are difficult to penetrate through the skin using lipid nanocarrier, technology in the formulation of cosmetic products can prove overcome this problem. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Prof. Epi, for a very informative sharing on the way to improve the penetration of natural active substances like antioxidants in skincare products. As we know that active ingredient from some natural sources have unfavorable, yeah, uh, undesirable chemical properties. So nanocarrier is one of the way to solve that problem. Okay. If you have any question to Prop Nora, you can write them down on the QA box because uh, we will address all the questions later. Now we move on to our last but not least a speaker, Dr. Goh Chon Fu from University Saints Malaysia. Okay, Dr. Goh Chon Fu uh, graduated with the farm with first class honors from USM in 2010 and completed his pre-registration training at Cebu Hospital, Sarawak. He was then offered to study abroad for PhD at the School of Pharmacy, University College London in UK. During his PhD study, he had opportunity to have a visiting scientist course in Monash University, Australia. After he finished his PhD, he was appointed as senior lecturer in pharmaceutical technology USM. He is now leading the research in mucosal and topical transdermal drug delivery in USM. His research now focuses on development of functional biomaterials from abandoned resources available in Malaysia. He is active in national and international scientific uh, societies, and he has also secured several national grants that worth more than uh, 200,000 ringgit Malaysia. His work is consistently published in prestigious journals such as Advanced Drug Delivery Reviews and Carbohydrate Polymers. Okay, Dr. Pu will present his talk on cellulose, an emerging biomaterial for nanoplatform design and dermal delivery. Dr. Go Chun Pu. The time is completely yours now. You may start. All right. Thank you, uh, moderator. Um, so allow me to share my slide. Right. Can you see my slide now? Yes, we are. Okay. All right. All right. Um, uh, as first of all, I think uh, thanks um, the uh, New Institutes uh, Pancasila for inviting me for sharing my some of my work um, exploiting uh, cellulose for nano delivery. Right, uh, so I think if you look around you, I think we are here in the tropical uh, regions in Malaysia um, and as well in Indonesia. I think this is not a, a, a strange uh, scene for you because I think trees and bushes are around us. So what is, what is fascinating me about uh, when I came back from, from, from UK is that I, so this is the natural resources that we have. So can we, can we valorize them for drug delivery? So, then we we'll talk about um, cellulose because cellulose is what this rainforest is contains. Okay, so this fascinating uh, biomaterials is 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 flexible and it can be you know used in various ways. So allow me to share with you a little bit on the cellulose. So since cellulose is a linear polymer of polysaccharide, so it's consisting of um, uh, thousands of uh, millions of units of this uh, uh, glucose that is interconnected by these bet beta glycosidic bonds. So on the surface of this chain is that it has a lot of these uh, uh, hydroxyl groups. So this will be a very good place for us to do a lot of modifications for drug delivery in particular. 
So that's why cellulose has been used in various applications and including drug delivery, as well as for textiles and electronics industry. So but our focus here today will be on drug delivery uh, in particular. So uh, we want to know more about cellulose because cellulose, it seems to be hydrophilic with a lot of hydrocyl group presence on the surface, but then it is kind of difficult to dissolve it. So in, a, in our recent review, we have uh, um, summarized some of the way to dissolve and cross into form the hydrogel, which is not part of the work. So we want to start with something easy because this is also something not familiar to us. So we go for something um, uh, that derivatized cellulose. So one of them is cellulose acetates. So other type of derivatized cellulose will be more familiar to you, be it HPMC, CMC, or uh, ethyl cellulose. Okay. So, but then we want to see how can we go nano with this kind of material because essentially it's a very long chain of uh, uh, polysaccharides. So one of the way we can think that is try to dissolve that in organic solvents and we go to electro spinning. So I'm not sure if electron spinning is familiar to you, but uh, this technique is able to generate a lot of nanofibers. And what happens is that uh, when you have the dissolved polymers that is uh, ejecting out from a, a, a charged uh, tips. So All right, for the first uh, video, we will see a poster video from Emma Triwulandari with the title is, eh? oh, sorry, for the first video, we will see from Nadia Putri Rahmawati with the title is the use of internet-based information media by pharmacists in South Jakarta in provision of pharmaceutical service during COVID-19 pandemic. Hello, I'm Nadia Putri Rahmawati. I'm from Faculty of Pharmacy at Pancasila University. Now I'm going to present my poster about the use of internet-based information media by pharmacies in South Jakarta in provision of pharmaceutical service during COVID-19 pandemic. The objective of this study is to evaluate the pattern of internet-based information media by community pharmacies to provide pharmaceutical service during COVID-19 pandemic. Pharmacies are the closest means for the community to get medicine, especially for people who want to sell medication. One of the clinical services that must be carried out by pharmacies in pharmacy is drug information service like name of drug, frequencies, interaction, side effect, and their prevention. The presence of COVID-19 has proved new challenge to pharmacies because it spread very fast. They must apply the precautionary principle in providing information and counseling amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Use of internet-based information media can be used as a way to adapt to the COVID-19 pandemic situation. An observational study with cross-sectional design was undertaken by disseminating online questionnaire to community pharmacies in South Jakarta, and I use a Google platform as Google Form as a platform. And data collection were conducted through Indonesian Pharmacy Association social media within the period of April until May. Until May 2021. Chi square test was used to compare the profession of pharmacies using online media before and during the pandemic. 
40 respondent participating in this study were majority were a female. And on average, the respondent age is 31 years old and only 5% were the proprietor of the pharmacist. And we also found that uh, the respondent usually using their smartphone to access online media. Uh, compared to pre-pandemic period, there were significantly more pharmacies search, searching internet-based uh, information media during COVID-19 pandemic to provide pharmaceutical service, predominantly drug information service. And WhatsApp is the most popular application uh, for sharing information, and Zoom is the most popular uh, video conference to uh, counseling. Some information sharing application like uh, Twitter that rarely use uh, pre-pandemic were used more intensively during the outbreak. Uh, the study also found that there was no difference in type of information search before and during the pandemic as interaction of appropriate medicine use it as the most frequent information. Thank you. Okay, thank you. If the judges and all the participants Hello, have a question, you can write down in the chat room. Okay, thank you for Nadia Putri for your presentation. Now we will next to the next video. For the second video, we will watch a video from Hafiz Ramadan with the title, The Antioxidant Can Anti Cancer in Silico of Phenolics and Flavonoids from Mangifera Species Using Molecular Docking Plants. Excuse me, miss. Yes. Yes. Uh, maybe the, sh the sound is not uh, here. All right. We will check it. Okay. Thank Wait you. for a minute. as to participate in the Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh My name is Hafiz Ramadan from Stikus Borneo Lestari Banjar
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Hafiz Ramadan from Stikus Borneo Lestari Banjarbaru, South Kalimantan. We would like to thank the University of Pancasila for allowing us to participate in this conference. On this occasion, we would like to present our research with the title The Antioxidant Anti-Cancer in Silico of Phenolics and Flavonoids from Mangifera Species Using Molecular Docking Plants. For introduction, cancer is the number two deadly disease in Indonesia and caused by free radicals. Based on this, antioxidant is necessary to prevent or inhibit the occurrence of chain oxidation reaction of free radicals. Plants that are widely proven to have antioxidant activity are the Mangifera species. Several of Mangifera species contain polyphenols including Mangiferin and its derivatives, carotenoid, vitamin C, and alpha tocopherol. These compounds have been shown to play a role in producing antioxidant activity in vitro even among them have anti-cancer. Based on this background, in order to explore the lead compounds that can potentially become new drug candidates, this research was implemented to study further antioxidant and anti-cancer activity of phenolic compound and flavonoid in the mangifera species through testing in silico using the molecular docking method with plants. For the method, the test compound included mangiferin, homomangiferin, isomangiferin, quercitrin, kaimperol 3 oligoside, catechin, epicatechin, dedzein, genistein, alpha tocopherol, and gallic acid. Vitamin C, doxorubicin, and hydroxyurea. Comparison compounds, the code of antioxidant protein targets downloaded from www.rscb.org with protein data bank. Protein preparation with the ASR program, preparation of native ligands, comparative compounds, and test compounds using Marvin sketch, plants application running via virtual box, the calculation of RMSD from the optimization result using the ASR program, native ligands files, test compounds, and comparative compounds obtained from the preparation procedure are then docked using the plants program again the predicted proteins. Determination of docking result is done by selecting the confirmation that has the lowest score. The docking result will visualize using Yesara. And the result shows the gallic acid have a better antioxidant potential than the other test compound, but vitamin C was better than native ligand against the 1P4S receptor. Alpha tocopherol has a better antioxidant potential compared to vitamin C and one on 1XAN. 2BEL and 5M2F, but could not reach the native ligand score. All test compounds have the potential <laughs> antioxidant against the 4K7O protein receptor, but alpha tocopherol is the only one that has the. The conclusion of this study based on this research, alpha tocopherol has the best antioxidant and anti-cancer activity compared to other test compounds through in silico study using plant method. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the presentation. If the judges and all the participants have a question, you can write down in the chat room. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Hafiz Ramadan, for your presentation. Now we will next to the other video. For the next video, we will watch a video from Dr. Apoteker Yesides Miati with the title, Review Article, The Potential of Natural Products in Inhibiting Premature Skin Aging. Hello everyone, good afternoon, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm Yesides Miati from Faculty of Pharmacy, Universitas Pancasila. I will present about my article, The Potential of Natural Product in Inhibiting Premature Skin Aging. Uh, the skin is the outermost organ of the body, so that the aging process that occurs in the skin is the most visible indicator of aging. We all know that uh, UV radiation is absorbed by skin molecules and generate reactive oxygen species. We also say rose causes oxidative damage to the cellular component like mitochondria and DNA. 
These rules can cause this premature skin aging involve dermis protein breakdown by some enzyme called matrix metalloproteinase, uh, such as uh, collagenase, uh, elastase, and hyaluronidase. The manifesting is visible wrinkle. Secondary metabolite compound from natural ingredients such as uh, flavonoid, polyphenol, alkaloid, and terpenes uh, prove have strong antioxidant activity and the potential to be anti-aging substances for the skin. The initial uh, stage of searching for natural ingredients that have anti-aging activity can be done by developing in vitro activity screening test methods such as uh, inhibitor of polygenase, uh, inhibitor of elastase, and uh, others. The methods that we use uh, are literature studies from national and international journals, including the original article, research article, patent, and others, with the total over uh, 40 journals. From the literature uh, search, it was found that many plants extract active compound and cosmetic preparation from the extract can inhibit those uh, enzymes. Some um, natural products, uh, berries, yeah, blueberries, blackberry, strawberry, mulberry, and others, uh, cucumber, um, grape, and others, yeah, um, so have activity as antioxidant, anti elastase anti-hyaluronidase, anti-collagenase, and anti-tyrosinase. So we can say they potentially a natural ingredient for anti-aging skin. In uh, figure two, well, we can see the compound that have anti-aging activity, uh, such as, such as uh, triterpenoid glycoside, uh, this is triterpenoid two, uh, flavonoid, polyphenol, uh, and others. Yeah. Uh, in figure three, we can see that uh, some flavonoid, yeah, galangin, camphorol, quercetin, myricetin, uh, it has a uh, difference in hydroxyl group and uh, the activity of anti elastase. Uh, the base is quercetin with uh, orthohydroxyl. Yeah? It shows that uh, the orthohydroxyl are important structure in their activity. In figure four, the group of compounds that are known, uh, known to have activity as enzyme inhibitors is a polyphenolic compound, especially the sweet multimer properties. Uh, flavonoid, especially those with orthohydroxyl group. Triterpenoids, especially pentacyclic essential oils and others. Conclusion in effort to find natural ingredient can be carried out in vitro screening tests to inhibiting the enzymes that affect premature skin aging, such as elastase, collagenase, tyrosinase, and antioxidant. Uh, phytochemical compounds that have activity inhibiting um, those enzymes include uh, polyphenolic compound, flavonoid, triterpenoid, and other terpenes. Plants that contain this compound have the potential to be used as raw materials in the formulation of anti-aging cosmetic preparation for the skin. Natural anti-wrinkle or anti-aging products can slow down the effect of skin aging and help people to live healthier and happier lives. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. All right, if the judges and all the participants have a question, you can write down in the chat room. If there's no any question, we thank you for Dr. Apoteker Yesides Nyati for your presentation. And now we will go to the next video. For the next video is from Ismaneli Hanum with the title is Physical Evaluation of nanoemulgel gel and emul gel dosage from containing ethanolic extract of kerstan leaves, a comparative study.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tengku Ismaneli Hanum from Faculty of Pharmacy, Universitas Sumatera Utara. Now, in this occasion, I would like to present our research with the title Physical Evaluation of Nanoemulgel and Emulgel Dosage Form Containing Ethanolic Extract of Kersen Muntinia Collaborative, a Comparative Study. The background of this research, Kersen leaf extract has potential antibacterial activity, which are indispensable for acne therapy. However, the poor stability of polyphenols in the extract can inhibit the activity of extract. The extract formulated in nanoemulgel promises to increase the effectiveness of treatment compared to emulgel because the smaller particle size can increase penetration in the stratum corneum of the skin and stability of the preparation. The aim of this study was to compare nanoemulgel with emulgel dosage form containing ethanolic extract of person leaves using various ozorfactants, twin 80 and co-surfactants, polyethylene glycol 400 concentration and evaluating the physical quality of the dosage form. Here's the methods. Nanoemulgel of ethanolic extract of kersen leaves was prepared by the spontaneous emulsification method. Preparation of each nanoemulgel was made in three various ratio of twin 80 and PEG 400 as well as as well of uh, F1, 34 to 26, F2, 36 to 24, and F3, 38 for 22, and 6% ethanolic extract of person lifts. The formula were evaluated included pH, viscosity, homogeneity, emulsion type, particle size, transmittance sense, and uh, stability test in various temperature. The result, all nanoemulgel dosage form remain stable in storage for 12 weeks at various temperature, had particle size in the range nanoscala, and which the optimal surfactant cost surfactant point was between 80 uh, to PEG 400 is 38 to 22 and interventional tension were 35 to 1 till 36 to 9 dynes per centimeters and no separation in the centrifugation test. However, emulgel dosage form had a particle size of 1477 to 34 nanometers, unstable after six weeks during storage at room temperature was well separated in the centrifugation test and had surface tension higher than nano, nano emulgel. The conclusion of this research, ethanolic extract of cursor leaves can be formulated as a nano emulgel dosage form which more stable compared to emulgel dosage form. That's all of my presentation. Thank you very much. All right. If there is any question from the judges and all for all the participants, you can write down in the chat room. And don't forget to fill the registration at the following link in the chat room. All right. If there's no any questions, thank you. Ms. Ismanel Lee Hanum for your presentation. And now we will go to the next video. For the next video, we will see a video from Ms. Lia Laila with the title <laughs> is the physical characterization comparison between clove oil nano emulsion with and without Cataranthus roseus 
don extract and their antioxidant activities. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I would like to present a part of our study entitled the Physical Characterization Comparison Between Cloth Oil Nano Emulsion with and Without Cataranthus Rhesus as you don't extract and their antioxidant activities. My name is Leah Laila, and I'm from Faculty of Pharmacy, University of Sumatra Utara. As we know that clove oil is one of the essential oils that is often used by the community as medicine. Of oil has been reported to have better power against free radical compounds compared to other essential oils. In addition to its advantages, of oil also composes fatty acid, which can be utilized as oil paste of emissions. Furthermore, to enhance its antioxidant activity, a plant extract contain of pyrogenic is suggested to be incorporated. Cataranthus associates LG adon extract was chosen as the plant extract model to increase the antioxidant activity of the clove oil based on emulsion. So the aim of this study was to develop a, a nano emulsion formulations using club oil and to characterize the physical properties, stability, and antioxidant activity of the nano emulsions. For the methods that we use, we mix oil water paste and oil paste. The water paste uh, consists of twin HG and chlorinic F127 as the surfactant, and also we use polyethanol 400 and ethanol as the co surfactant And then so we use a Parabent and propyl parabent as the preservative. We mix the water paste and the cloth oil with the magnetic stirrer and then we stir for five hours at the rate of 1200 rpm. The result, as shown in the figure, the F0 is the without extract, and then the F1 with the cataractus uh, residues extract about 2%. These are the evolution of the and emotion, the organolytic characteristic, pH determination, emotion type determination, viscosity, particle size, antioxidant activity, and then the accelerated stability study. As the result, uh, both of the formula show a transparent dosage form with the uh, F0 without the extract, show a transparent yellow color, and then the uh, FG1 the, with the extract show a transparent dark green color. The formula with the uh, the extract has a lower pH compared to the uh, formula without the extract. Both of the formula show the homogeneous and then show oil in water type of emulsions. And then for the viscosity, the formula without the extract has less viscosity uh, compared to the formula with the extract. And then uh, for the particle size, for the formula with the extract has a big, bigger particle size compared to the formula without the extract. As seen in the figure, we see the particles distributions for the formula without the extract has a narrow particle size dispersion compared to the formula with the uh, cataractus such as extract has a wider particle size distributions. And then for the antioxidant category, for the antioxidant test, uh, the formula with the extract has strong uh, antioxidant category. And then the formula without the extract has a medium antioxidant category. And for the stability test show, there is no changes in color, homogeneity, and also the type of emulsion uh, for the, uh, during the story at the 35 and 40 degrees Celsius for three months. And also for, uh, has the same result for the uh, stability test using the freestyle and certification method. As a conclusion, the club oil based on the emulsion loaded with the cantaractus rushes LG don successfully produced with very good characterizations and stable in extreme storage and has strong antioxidant activity. Thank you very much for your attention. All right. If there are the judges and all the participants have a question, please write down on the chat room. Okay, there's no any question. So thank you for Ms. Lia Laila for your presentation. Okay, we will go to the next video. For the next video, we will see a video from Fitri Yuniarti, Master of Science, with the title is Screening Antibacterial Activity and Molecular Identification of Lactic Acid Bacteria from Fermented Cabbage Against Sigella Dysenteria Pathogen Bacteria.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Nama saya Fitri Yuniati Saya dari Universitas Muhammadiyah Profesor Dr. Hamka Jakarta uh, Di sini saya akan mencoba mempresentasikan Poster atau uh, penelitian kami Yang berjudul Screening aktivitas antibakteri Dan identifikasi molekular uh, Bakteri asam laktat dari fermentasi kubis uh, Terhadap bakteri Sigella di Sentriae Ya Oh, jadi di sini eh, kita meng- melakukan screening aktivitas antibakteri terhad- eh, bakteri asam laktat ya bakteri asam laktat terhadap bakteri patogennya itu kita pilih di eh, sigela di sentriae. Nah eh, setelah dilakukan screening didapatkan isolat yang memiliki aktivitas tertinggi aktivitas antibakteri tertinggi kita lanjutkan dengan identifikasi molekularnya. Nah, identifikasi molekular ini kita menggunakan metode PCR dengan menggunakan gen 16 sRNA. Nah, pemilihan e, kubis di e, pemilihan e, apa? kubis di sini e, sebagai sumber bakteri asam laktat itu dikarenakan kubis itu merupakan salah satu sayuran yang mengandung cukup tinggi karbohidrat ya. Jadi karbohidrat itu merupakan substrat nanti yang nantinya akan dipecah oleh bakteri asam laktat menjadi senyawa asam laktat yang merupakan salah satu senyawa metabolit sekunder atau senyawa antibakteri ya kita gunakan sebagai senyawa antibakteri nah kubis ini kita dapatkan dari kubis lokal ya itu dari pasar Bekasi oke okay. untuk identifikasi molekulernya kita menggunakan metode PCR dengan menggunakan gen 16 sRNA setelah itu Kita lakukan hasil dari amplifikasi dengan PCR, kita lakukan uh, sequencing uh, dan analisis data dengan uh, metode BLAST. Nah, uh, jadi secara keseluruhan untuk tujuan dari penelitian ini, kita akan melakukan isolasi bakteri asam wakta, setelah itu kita lakukan screening aktivitas antibakterinya, dan terakhir kita lakukan uh, identifikasi atau uh, apa karakterisasi secara molekular e, bakteri asam laktat tersebut yang memiliki aktivitas tertinggi terhadap bakteri patogen Sigella di Sentriae. Oke, kita lanjutkan. Nah, pada slide berikutnya, ini metode yang kami gunakan yaitu e, tahap-tahapannya. Yang pertama kita melakukan fermentasi, fermentasi kubis terlebih dahulu. Nah, setelah itu kubis yang difermentasi kita isolasi bakteri asam laktat dari kubis e, fermentasi kubis tersebut ya. Jadi isolasi bakteri asam laktat e, dari fermentasi kubis selanjutnya kita karakterisasi baik secara makroskopis maupun mikroskopis. Nah, ini untuk e, tahap berikutnya ya. Kalau makro itu secara morfologinya, kalau mikro itu dengan pewarnaan gram. Nah, selanjutnya kita lakukan screening aktivitas antibakteri. Nah, ini kita lakukan screening aktivitas antibakteri bal terhadap bakteri patogen Sigella di Sentriae. Lalu isolat terpilih yang merupakan isolat dengan aktivitas antibakteri tertinggi. Itu nanti akan kita lakukan isolasi DNA. selanjutnya kita amplifikasi dengan PCR DNA-nya. Selanjutnya kita sequencing eh, hasil amplifikasinya kita sequencing gen dengan menggunakan gen 16 sRNA. Selanjutnya kita identifikasi hasil sequencingnya eh, dengan eh, apa metode BLAST ya. Jadi terakhir hasil identifikasi hasil sequencingnya diidentifikasi dengan metode BLAST. Nanti dia akan mendapatkan eh, persen kemiripan dengan bakteri yang ada di gene bank atau data-data yang ada di bank DNA di seluruh dunia oke selanjutnya nah pada slide ini menjelaskan tentang hasil hasil dari yang kita lakukan pada tahap awal isolasi ya jadi pada gambar pertama itu isolasi bakteri asam laktat yang kita lakukan di pada e, dari berbagai macam pengenceran. Nah, kita lakukan pengenceran itu dari 10-2 sampai 10-7. E, tapi setelah dilihat hasilnya kita mengambil memutuskan untuk mengambil dari 10-5 sampai 10-7 ya. Jadi ada 3 petri dis yang berisi isolat bakteri asam laktat. 
Nah, untuk masing-masing pengenceran, pada 10 mm kita ambil 3 isolat, K31, 32, 33. Pada 10 min 6, pengenceran 10 min 6, kita ambil 2 isolat, yaitu K34, 35. Dan pada pengenceran 10 min 7, kita ambil K36, 1 isolat. Nah, pemilihan isolat ini berdasarkan bentuk atau karakterisasi morfologi yang mencirikan morfologi yang terbaik ya, jadi dari morfologinya kita lihat mana yang mencirikan bakteri asam laktat yang eh, paling baik dan paling bagus untuk eh, morfologinya nah, akhirnya kita putuskan mengambil 6 isolat oke, untuk eh, tabel atau gambar yang kedua itu merupakan hasil dari screening aktivitas antibakteri eh, bal atau bakteri asam laktat terhadap bakteri patogen Sigella dysentriae. Nah, di sini kita menggunakan fermentasi hari fermentasinya itu dari hari 1 hari sampai 7 hari. Nah, nanti kita lihat zona ambat dari masing-masing isolat yang kita pilih, mana yang memiliki aktivitas tertinggi. Nah, ini masing-masing hari ini sudah dilakukan triplo ya. Jadi, tiga kali pengulangan dan ini merupakan hasil rata-ratanya. Nah, dari hasil yang didapatkan, eh, kita totalkan ini yang memiliki aktivitas eh, antibakteri tertinggi terhadap bakteri patogen, itu kita ambil eh, isolat K32. Ya, jadi, diputuskan yang memiliki aktivitas antibakteri tertinggi itu isolat K32. Nah, isolat K32 inilah nantinya yang akan digunakan untuk eh, tahap berikutnya, yaitu identifikasi molekular dengan metode PCR. Nah, ini eh, pada identifikasi molekular dengan metode PCR, eh, kita melakukan amplifikasi ya. Amplifikasi eh, pada gambar ini dapat dilihat bahwa amplifikasi berhasil dilakukan eh, dengan ditandainya ada fragmen DNA. Nah, di sini ada fragmen DNA pada gel agarose yang dapat dilihat pada gambar ya. Nah, besaran fragmen DNA dari uh, isolat kita, yaitu isolat K32, itu sesuai ya dengan iso, uh, bakteri, yaitu 1500 base pair. 1500 base pair. Nah, jadi uh, hasil ampli, amplikon yang telah di elektrofolesis ini selanjutnya dilakukan proses sequencing. Nah, itu nanti hasil dari amplifikasi ini, amplikonnya kita lakukan proses sequencing. Uh, untuk mengetahui urutan bahasa nukleotidanya, ya. Nah, setelah uh, dilakukan sequencing, kita lakukan pengolahan data uh, dengan menggunakan program BLAST. Nah, jadi hasil sequencing yang kita lakukan, kita lakukan pengolahan data dengan menggunakan program BLAST uh, secara online, itu yang ada pada website NCBI. Nah, setelah itu baru didapatkan uh, Nanti hasil dari analisis datanya digunakan untuk membandingkan data sekuen yang dimiliki oleh oleh isolat kita dari hasil penelitian dengan sekuen-sekuen DNA yang berada dari penjuru dunia ya. Jadi yang ada pada ginbang pada bank bank DNA atau yang disebut juga dengan ginbang ya. Nah itu nanti dibandingkan nanti untuk melihat dengan Uh, apa namanya bakteri mana dia memiliki kemiripan dan berapa nilainya nah setelah dilakukan uh, analisis dengan metode BLAST maka uh, didapatkan bahwa isolat K32 itu memiliki urutan bahasa nukleotida yang kemiripannya uh, Paling dekat itu dengan bakteri Lactobacillus buchneri strain JCM 115 ya. Dengan nilai Quaverico rate-nya yaitu sekitar 99%. Nah, untuk uh, persen identitas yang diperolehnya itu sebesar 99%. Nah, jadi dari hal tersebut menyatakan bahwa isolat K32 itu memiliki persen kesamaan bahasa nukleotidanya 99% dengan database dari bakteri uh, Actobacillus buchneri tadi. Oke, okay. uh, jadi uh, kesimpulan secara keseluruhan dari penelitian ini 
yaitu kita mendapatkan 6 isolat dari hasil isolasi uh, bank selanjutnya dari hasil screening aktivitas antibakteri kita mendapatkan isolat K32 yang memiliki daya hambat yang paling besar terhadap bakteri patogen Shigella dysentriae selanjutnya hasil dari identifikasi molekularnya kita mendapatkan isolat K32 itu uh, memiliki analisis sekuen uh, persen kemiripan 99% dengan bakteri Lactobacillus buchneri strain JCN 115 oke okay, jadi uh, itu uh, sedikit tentang uh, penelitian kami terima kasih assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Right, if there is any question from the judges or for the, from the participant. If there's no any question, thank you for Miss Fitri Yuniarti, Magister Science for your presentation video. Now we will go to the next video. For the next video, we will see a video from Dr. Sally Carlina, Magister Farmasi, with the title is The Formulation of Nano Emulsion Serum Containing Pegagan Extract and Chia Seed Oil for Skin Hydrocene Effect. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sally Carlina, and I'm a medical doctor. Today, I will be happy to present my work, my research with the title The Formulation of Nano Emulsion Serum Containing Pegagan Extract or Vanilla Asiatica and Chia Seed Oil or Salvia Hispanica for Skin Hydration Effect. For the beginning, I want to talk about hydration. One of the problem of face skin is hydrate or moistness. This problem is caused by water content in the skin. Moisturizer should be selected based on its capability to improve skin permeability. Moisturizer product contain ingredients capable to moisturize. Those are occlusive, humectant, emollient, and protein rejuvenator. Natural product that have characteristic as protein rejuvenator is Centella Asiatica. And natural product that having characteristic as emollient is chia seed oil. We want to combine Centella extract and chia seed oil to get synergic effect for skin moistness and will be produced by the nanotechnology become nano emulsion. First step method is provide main ingredients such as central asiatica herb in dry form and was processed to become dry powder by grinding and then was standardized. Next process is optimization of extraction method to looking for the best method of extraction. Next is extraction by kinetic maceration using 70% ethanol and then rotary evaporation to become thick extract. Evaluation was conducted to obtain a standardized extract and the last process is producing nano emulsion serum and then evaluation the quality of serum. The result explained that Centella Asiatica herb extraction method used kinetic maceration with 70% ethanol the optimal one was to use a ratio of 1 to 20 and maceration time 2 hours which result in an extra yield of 28.74%. Production of Central Asiatic Herb Extract, both Simplicia and Tech Extract, have standard value of the herbal pharmacopoeia. The nano emulsion preparation produced in this study have been tested on respondent and have a good uh, moisturizing effect based on statistical analysis there is a significant difference from before and after the use of serum those all my presentation of my research i hope this research will give benefit to other who interested on herbal based product for medical purpose more importantly to give benefit for indonesia in promoting local natural product for industrial benefit thank you very much for your attention All right, if there are any questions from the judges or from the participants. Okay, if there's no any question, thank you for Dr. Sally Karlina Magister Farmasi for your presentation. Now we will go to the next video.
the next video we will see a presentation from apoteker Della Amalia Putri, Sarjana Farmasi Magister Farmasi, with the title is Organic Lip Cream Formulation with Beetroot Coloring and Chia Seed Oil Moisturizer. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning everyone. I'm Della Amalia Putri. I will present my paper with title Organic Lip Cream Formulation with Natural Color from Beetroot Beta Vulgaris L and Chia Seed Oil Moisturizer Salvia Hispanica. And the author is myself, Dela Ahmalia Putri, and my team is Khaidir and Muhammad Hanafi. We are from the Pancasila University, Jakarta, Indonesia. Lip cream is one of the most cosmetic preparations for four by women. Lip cream that are applied to the lips to give shape and color and protect the lips from the environment. However, the number of harmful chemical dyes uh, can cause allergies, nausea, dermatitis, and cause dry lips. By using organic beets root as natural color and oil from the organic chia seed as a natural moisturizer, it aims that it can reduce problems on the lips and provide safer result compared to using synthetic or non-organic natural ingredients. Therefore, the study was conducted to formulate liquid lipstick preparation of beetroot extract and tested to physical quality, effectiveness, safety, acceptability, and stability. Physical quality tests including organoleptic, viscosity, pH, and homogeneity. The effectiveness test includes adhesion, spreadability, and moisture content test. The safety test includes the hedonic acceptability test and the irritation test and the stability test, which is includes organoleptic stability, pH, and color homogeneity. The material and methods, uh, we, uh, we use the uh, beetroots from two method cultivation, the organic and the uh, conventional, and <coughs> We use three uh, solvent, three different solvent. It's a uh, solvent with ethanol, ethanol citric acid, pH 5, and then the water. And we compare the uh, total uh, betalain assay. And uh, be, the organic beetroot uh, extract with the base solvent and chia seed oil. Uh, we standardize the extract and the chia seed oil as described in the table. And then we do the formulation lip cream using organic beetroot and organic chia seed oil. Formulated liquid lipstick preparation of beet extracted and tested for physical quality, effectiveness, safety, acceptability, and stability. For the conclusion based on the results of the research that has been done, it can be concluded that one, uh, the first, organic beets contain significantly greater than uh, beets from conventional cultivation. The, and second, the ethanol softened with the addition of citric acid extracted the beta line pigment from organic beets was significantly greater than other softened. And the last is organic chia seed oil and organic beetroot extract which is formulated in a lip cream preparation that meets the specification of good lip cream, does not cause irritation, can effectively moisture lips, and is stable for 4 weeks at 40 degrees Celsius. Thank you. All right, is there any question from the judges or the participants? Okay, if there's no any question, thank you for thank you for apoteker Della Amalia Putri, Sarjana Farmasi, Magister Farmasi for your presentation. And now we will go to the next video. The next video is from Wilik Nur Hidayati with the title is Characterization FTIR Spectra Profile and Platelet Anti-Aggregation Activity of Crude Fucoidan from Sargassum Crassi Volume. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to present our research with title of Characterization FTIR Spectra Profile and Platelet Anti-Aggregation Activity of crude fucoidan for sarcasum crassifolium. The affiliate of sarcasum in Java is a potential source of self-sufficiency in raw material, especially for cardiovascular disease. The exploration of sarcasum for cardiovascular disease has been reported in several publications. Fucoidan as the marker of sarcasum cis 
has a very complex structure and vary from each species. Sargassum plasifolium is one of the brown seaweed that grows in Java that has various activity. Many publications report for this species. However, Bocoidan characters and FTIR profile associated with platelet ATP induced aggregation inhibition activity of this species has not been mentioned before. This research was aimed to investigate the characterization and FTIR profile in correlation with platelet anti-aggregation activity of crude vocation from sargassum crassifolium. This is our method. Sargassum crassifolium was collected from September until December. The crude vocation was extracted according to Fletcher et al. and the dark brown uh, powder then uh, analyzed for focus sulfate carbohydrate content FTIR spectra and evaluated the in vitro and platelet anti aggregation activity. Partial sequence analysis was conducted to identify the functional group that contribute the platelet anti aggregation activity. This is our result. The statistical analysis shows significant differences in focus, sulfate, carbohydrate content, and platelet anti aggregation activity uh, that uh, express as IC50 of ufocoidin extracted for different harvest time. According to the result of PLS analysis using FTI spectra data and the value of IC50, the functional group that contributes the platelet anti-aggregation activity were hydrophil, carbonyl, and SO. As a conclusion, platelet anti-aggregation activity of crude fucoidin is proportional to the level of sulfur, not to fucose and carbohydrate levels. The functional group of the crude fucoidin, which were correlated with this activity, could it be identified. Thank you. All right, is there any question from the judges or from the participants? Okay, if there's no any question, thank you for Ms. Lilik Nur Hidayati for your presentation. You're welcome. All right, now we will go to the next video. For the next video, we will see a presentation from Dr. Apoteker Nima De Dwi Sandi Utami, Sarjana Science Magister Kesehatan, with the title Anti-Inflammatory and Analgesic Activity of Musa Acuminata and Musa Balbisiana Pill in Vivo. This poster presented our research with the title Anti-inflammatory and analgesic activity of Musa acuminata ex Musa balbiciana pill in vivo. Inflammation is a complex biological response of vascular tissue to noxious stimuli such as pathogens, damaged body cells, or irritants. Inflammation is triggered by the release of chemical mediators from damaged tissue and cell migration. Pain, retinal swelling, tissue, and organ dysfunction are signs of inflammation. The rib kepok banana pill Musa acuminata ex Musa balbisiana contain high level of flavonoids, alkaloids, tannin, saponins, and triterpenoids. Flavonoids function to slow down the inflammatory process through inhibition of the arachidonic acid metabolic pathway the formation of prostaglandins, and the release of histamine. The study aimed to examine the anti-inflammatory and analgesic effect of kapok banana pills decoction in vivo. This research was conducted experimentally using the winter methods for anti-inflammatory assay by induction of carrageenan on the soles of rats' feet and Sigmund's method for analgesic assay with intraperitoneal induction of acetic acid in mice. Group 1 as a negative control, group 2 as positive control with sodium diclofenac as a comparison control, 
Group 3 as a low dose 200 mg per kilogram body weight of kepok banana pill decoction. Group 4 as a medium dose 400 mg per kilogram body weight of kepok banana pill decoction. And group 5 as a high dose 800 mg per kilogram body weight of kepok banana pill decoction. The results show percentage of inhibition in the anti-inflammatory test in rats for group 2, 3, 4, and 5 was 34.43%, 17.68%, 25.53%, and 25.4%. And the percentage of effectiveness for the anti-inflammatory test respectively was 51.35%, 74.15%, and 74.01%. The results of the percentage inhibition of the analgesic test in mice for group 2, 3, 4, and 5 were 55.25%, 38.15%, 25.4%, point and 49.31 percent and the percentage of effectiveness for the analgesic test respectively followed by 61.71 percent 80.59 percent and 89.24 percent based on the description above it can be concluded that the decoction of the Kepok banana peel has an anti-inflammatory and analgesic effect. Alright, is there any question from the judges or the participants? Okay, if there's no any question... Thank you for Dr. Apoteker Nima Dewi Sandi Utami, Sarjana Science, Magister Kesehatan, for your presentation. And now we will go to the next video. For the next video, we will see a video from Yunahara Farida with the title is Quality Parameters and Determination of Total Flavonoid Levels from the Highest Antioxidant Activity of Ethanol 70% Extract Jackfruit Peel by Maceration, Reflux, and ultrasonic methods. I will present my research with the title Quality Parameters and Determination of Total Flavonic Levels from the Highest Antioxidant Activity of Ethanol 70% Extract from the Jackfruit Peel Atrocarpus Hirtaropingus by maceration, reflux, and sonication method. This is the background. Free radical can form new radical compounds that produce excess free radical in the body. This situation can be overcome with compounds that are antioxidant. In the recent years, the popularity of herbal medicine has greatly increased. One of the interesting plants is a jackfruit or Atocarpus heteropilus. And then, based on the research, jackfruit rain of the ethanol extract has content of alkaloid, flavonoid, phenol, and terpenoid. Jackfruit plants are thought to have up down of flavonoid content. Phenolic compounds such as uh, flavonoid exhibition antioxidant activity. The traditional medicine in Indonesia market must meet the recruitment quality, safety, and usefulness. Therefore, in, it is necessary to develop quality standards, safety, and benefit to extract medical plants. So, it must be determined first the general standard parameter medical plant extract for, for use in formal healthy service. One of the influencing factors on the quality of the extract is the method extraction use. The aim of this study was to investigate and determination of total flavonate levels from the highest antioxidant activity of the 70% ethanol extract of the jackfruit peel atrocarpus heteropilus by maceration, reflux, and ultrasonic. The purpose is the research is to find out the difference in antioxidant activity of ethanol extract in jackfruit peel from maceration, reflux, and ultrasonication method. This is the result. Uh, the IC50 
the best IC50 with the maceration method uh, the value is 88.38 and then the total flavonoid content was 1.72 percent and then conclusion the result of photochemical screening indicate that jackfruit peel contain flavonoid saponin tannin and triterpenoid and the best antioxidant activity is the found in the maceration method the extract of the jackfruit peel fulfill the quality parameter requirement All right, is there any question from the judges or the participants? If there is no any question, thank you, Miss Yunahara Farida, for your presentation. And now we will go to the next video. The next video is from Dr. Neneng Siti Sylvie Ambarwati, Magister Science. With the title is Isolation, Identification, and Antibacterial Activity of Ament Amentoflavon from Garcinia Latissima Leaf. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Hello everyone, my name is Nani Siti Sylvia Anwarwati I'm from Engineering Faculty Universitas Negeri Jakarta I'm Recent study, an attempt has been made to isolate and identify species and bacterial compound present in the leaves of isolation processes are silica gel on chromatography. LH20 column chromatography and preparative thin layer chromatography silica gel. Based on the HNMR measurement result indicates the presence of a benzene ring with the APX system. The presence of two doublet protons indicates the presence of benzene with its ortho and symmetric position system A to B2. Based on the data on the value of clinical cell splitting pattern and HSQC and compared with the above compounds, this compound is a biflavonoid. The complete chemical share value comp compared to the literature can be seen in the table. By looking at the HNMR chemical C value, the CNMR chemical C value, the HSQC correlation, and confirmed by the result of 2D HMBC NMR measurement, this compound is strongly suspected to be aminoflavone. From the result of the antibacterial activity test against special subtilis using the microdilution method, the minimum inhibitory concentration value of the isolate or amentoflavone was 1,250 ppm. Thank you for your attention. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. All right. If there is any question from the judges or the participants. Right, if there's no any question,
Thank you. Dr. Neneng Siti Sulfi Ambarwati, Magister Science, for your presentation. And now we will go to the next video. The next video is from Luciana Ariani with the title is In Vitro Evaluation of Antioxidant and Antielastes of Bacchaurea, Macrocarpa, and Terminalia Catapa Leaves and Bark. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to me for sharing our research today in the fifth International Conference on Pharmaceutical Nanotechnology and Nanomedicine 2021. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Luciana Ariani. And in this research, I have a team. They are Yesi Desmiati and Endah Wulandari. The title of my Research is in vitro evaluation of antioxidant and antielastase of Bacchaurea macrocarpa and Terminalia catapa leaves and bark. For the introduction, Indonesia is a country that is rich in natural ingredients. One of the cosmetic that were in great demand is anti-aging. Elastase was an enzyme that was responsible for the breakdown of elastin in the dermis of the skin. So, if we inhibit Elastase enzyme activity could prevent premature aging of the skin, especially wrinkles. Antioxidants were compounds that could slow down or prevent the oxidation process. So it could be overcome the, the premature aging process. And in this research, we using Indonesian native plant. They are tampoi and ketapang, the leaves and the bark. For the materials and method, for plant materials, we can get the plant from Balitro, Bogor Institute of Spices and Medicinal Plants, West Java, Indonesia. And the plant were determination at Botanical Garden Conservation Center, Bogor, West Java, Indonesia. And for the chemical and reagent, we using amyl alcohol, ammonium, Aquades, chloride acid, epigallocatechin galat, vitamin C, sana substrate, and etc. The method and research came we using dry simplicia of tampoi and ketapang leaves and bark, and the dry simplicia we do extraction with 96% of ethanol, and we get viscose extract, and then the viscose extract was we test for anti-elastase assay, antioxidant assay, and phytochemical screening. And the result of, my, of our research are phytochemical screening shown in table one, and in vitro anti-elastase activity test show in table two, antioxidant activity test show in table three. In table one, phytochemical screening, all plants, tampoi leaves, tampoi bark, ketapang leaves, and ketapang bark had a flavonoid, saponin, tannin, quinone, steroid, triterpenoid, essential oil, and coumarin. And for the in vitro anti-elastase activity test, all extract had a good activity with IC50 or inhibitory concentration value less than 60 ppm. We using epigallocatechin as a positive control, this, and for the antioxidant activity test show in table three, 
we using DPPH as a reagent and vitamin C as a standard. And from the result, all extracts show a good antioxidant activity, especially for tampoy leaves had the strongest antioxidant activity with IC50 value is 15.09 ppm. So it can be concluded that all extra were evaluated against skin aging through in vitro antioxidant, anti-elastase assay. And the study showed that ethanolic extract of tampoy leaf, tampoy bark, ketapang leaf, and ketapang bark exhibited promising antioxidant and anti-elastase activity and can be used as a potential anti-wrinkle agent in anti-aging skincare formulation. And in this research, or our poster presentation, we using uh, three references uh, by Mukriji, by Gunawan, and references from Lin. Thank you for your attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. All right, is there any question from the judges or the participants? All right, if there's no any question, thank you for Miss Luciana Ariani for your presentation. And now we will go to the next video. The next video is from Esti Mulatsari with the title is Synthesis and Characterization of Ketosan from Craft Shell Waste and its Application as Edible Coating to Increase Fruit Shelf Life. Synthesis and characterization of ketosan from crop cell waste and its application as edible coating. Strawberry is a fruit which has high economic value, but strawberry are perishable fruits, so required handling in post harvest to keep its value. In other case, there are abundant crop solvers in PT Sigur Jaya Abadi. And as we know, crop solvers can be used to synthesize cytosine that have many advantages in many fields, such as pharmaceutical, cosmetic, food, and textile. So, in this research, we have done synthesis of ketosan from crop waste from PT Sigur Jaya Abadi and formulated it to edible coating to increase shelf life of strawberry. Step by step method from synthesis, formulated antimicrobial activity test, and application to edible coating have done and get many results. The result of this research are Chitosan that synthesis from crop cells from PT Sigur Jaya Abadi have many good characteristics and meet the requirement as Chitosan for food product. The formula of edible coating was various in 0.5 until 2% of Chitosan. 2% of cytosan have the best activity in inhibiting growth of bacteria in this Escherichia coli. Handling strawberry with cytosan edible coating can increase shelf life of strawberry in more 5 days than no handling. 
and its no effect in color, sin, taste, and visual of strawberry by hedonic taste. So we can conclude that Chitosan, the synthesis from Krebs solvers from PT Sigurjaya Abadi, can be formulated into edible coating and can increase self life of strawberry. Many thanks to Faculty of Pharmacy Universitas Pancasila for this research funding through FFOP Internal English Grant Program. Thank you. All right. Is there any question from the judges or from the participants? If there is any question, thank you, Mrs. Esti Mulatsari, for your presentation. And now we will go to the next video. The next video is from Mrs. Novianti, with the title is Immunomodulator Activity of Zizipus Spinal Leaf Extracts Based on Phagocytosis Activity in Rats. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending. In this session, I want to present about immunomodulator activity of Zizipus pinacristial leaf extract based on bagocytosis activity in rats. I am Novianti and I collaborate with Elvira Andini, Sarah Zaidan, Kartuningsi, and Desina Jaulena. We are from Faculty of Pharmacy, Universitas Pancasila. First of all, I want to thank to Universitas Pancasila for funding this research. Arabic bitter Azizipus pinacristial contains a plafonide. Plafonide has properties to improve the human immune system and has the potential as immunomodulators. The purpose of this study was to obtain the immunomodulator activity of Azizipus pinacristial leaf extract based on phagocytosis activity in malware rats. Leaves were resurrected with 70% as for 24 hours. The rats were divided into six groups, where each group consists of uh, four rats. Group was treated with water as a normal control, suspending agent carboxymethyl cellulose sodium as a negative control and palantosinary product as a positive control. And also Zizipus pinacristial leaf extract at a dose of 100, 200, and 400 milligram per kilograms BW for seven days. On the eighth day, groups uh, were infected with Staphylococcus aureus, red eutanasia, uh, perform the surgery in the abdominal cavity of rats and collect the peritoneal food. The peritoneal food was smeared and the preparation were filled under a microscope. The results show that there were an increase in phagocytic activity with increasing extra dose and higher activity than negative control group. This indicate that the extracts have activity as an immunomodulator. Its activity was lower than uh, parenthus neurory products and parenthus neurory product phagocytosis activities were 83.5% uh, for activity and 601 five for capacity which calculated against 100 macrophages. This is the uh, figure of activity phagocytic and capacity phagocytic for the first, second, third, four, five, and six groups. The conclusion of this research, Zizipus spina crystal leaf extract have immunomodulatory activity based on the activity and capacity phagocytic of macrophages in malware rats, but its immunomodulatory activity was lower than that of Kansas narrow product as a positive control. Thank you very much for your uh, attention, ladies and gentlemen. 
Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. All right, is there any question from the judges or the participants? Okay, if there's no any question, thank you for Mrs. Novianti for your presentation. And now we will go to the next video. The next video is from Mrs. Kartiningsi with the title is Formulation in Tablet Form of Nanoparticles Fucoidan Crude Form Extract Brown Seaweed as Antioxidant. and antioxidant. Focoidan is liposose sulfat with saccharidal form in brown seaweed and has antioxidant activity. Crude has hidden hostile water to beauty so it made into nanoparticle. The purpose is this study into the phenomenon of effects of making nanoparticle on dissolution profile of crude focoidan tablet and crude focoidan nanoparticle tablet. To procedure tablet that meet the physical purification requirement and to determine of the fucoidan and antioxidant effect. Crude fucoidan nanoparticles are made by the ionic rationic method using cytosan. Crude fucoidan and crude fucoidan nanoparticles were made into tablets from using the direct compression method and made using ML tipe C as killer binder and sodium sulfate and postamer sodium as this integrotan. The particles have nanoparticle 64.1 nanometer, the polyether index 0.433, the potential data is 47.6, and this very safe. ACTP or Krupokaidan and Krupokaidan nanoparticle were 19.33152 ppm and 104.1607 ppm. Meanwhile, ICTP of tablet formula 5 and formula 6 were 7.272 ppm and 82.1314 ppm. The dissolution precipitation of formulation 2, 3, 5, and 6 and 20, 100 minutes and 40 percent and 56 percent and and 35 percent and 50 percent. All right. Is there any question from the judges or the participants? If there is no question, thank you for Mrs. Kateningsi for your presentation. And now we will go to the next video. The next video is from Diera Forestriana with the title is Development of Liquid Crystal Nanoparticle Gel Loaded Binjai Leaf of Methanol Extract. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon. My name is Wahidin bin Jamaluddin. I'm from Stikas Borneo Lestari Banjar Baru. Thank you for allowing me to present my poster about development of liquid crystal nanoparticle gel loaded binjai leaf mangifera KCG of methanol extract. Free radical are one of the factors that cause damage to skin caused by air pollution and overexposure of ultraviolet. So, antioxidants are needed to handle it. On previous research show that binjai leaf also binjai leaf on methanol extract has strong activity as antioxidant with IC50 6.448 gram per milliliter. With the potential, it can be developed as topical formula. Other than that, liquid crystal nanoparticle, also known as a technology of, that can increase the drug 
penetration. Therefore, the objective of this research are to develop and determine the optimum formula of gel and liquid crystal nanoparticle incorporated into gel with variation and concentration of gelling agent. The binge leaf were extracted in chocolate method, then prepared in conventional gel and liquid crystal nanoparticle gel loaded methanol extract of binjai leaf. Liquid crystal nanoparticle were prepared with hot homogenization and sonication according to table 1. Later, it in formula of gel were prepared with variation of gelling agents such as tragacan, sodium, CMC, and viscolum according to table 2. The physical character of both gel show that show in table three. Liquid crystal nanoparticle gel ha have more viscosity because of surfactant and lipid were added in formula. Formula eight and nine show that no significant before and after fisto. Also, hedonic test show formula eight of liquid crystal nanoparticle gel gel have mostly preferred. The in vitro penetration study show liquid crystal nanoparticle gel had increased compared to the conventional gel by 4.03 times because of liquid crystal nanoparticle can increase water retention to maintain high skin hydration. The in vitro release profile of liquid crystal nanoparticle gel could be expressed by Higuchi equation with linearity 0 0.6 0 0.9834 so it can be concluded a uh, gel formula of liquid crystal nanoparticle has been successfully developed with an advantage over the methanol extract of binjai leaf the liquid crystal nanoparticle system can be increased the amount of penetration of the binjai extract compared to the gel of methanol extract binjai leaf the molecular structure of the capmoles GMO90 which used in the preparation